Hey, good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. Go ahead and call the meeting to order and welcome you to the Coeur d'Alene School District 271 board meeting for January 8th, 2018. Would the gentlemen please remove their hats and everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Thank you and good evening. Before we get going tonight, I'd like to introduce tonight's participants and I'll start at my far right. Uh, first up is Mr. Chris Shipley, our Director of Finance and Operations, Ms. Lynn Town, Clerk of the Board, and Dr. Stan Olson, Superintendent. To my immediate left is Tom Hearn, our Vice Chair, Ms. Lisa May, Trustee, Ms. Tamber Pickford, Trustee, and Mr. Dave Eubanks, Trustee. My name is Casey Morsro, and I am our board chair. Public comment on district-related items is scheduled near the start of this meeting. Please sign in on the sheet provided at the entrance door. Because of the diversity of issues, members of the board will not respond to public comment made during tonight's meeting. Instead, issues may be recorded and referred to the proper staff person for follow-up. Comments may also be submitted to the board in writing through the clerk. Thank you. Okay, board members uh, and audience, we do have a addendum to the agenda tonight. That uh, would be an item L for the consent agenda, a travel request for Lake City High School softball. Um, it was uh, it was inadvertently missed, so we need to add that into the, tonight's consent agenda. So, is there a motion to approve the amended agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Oh, sorry. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And is there a motion to approve the minutes from December 4th, 2017? So moved. Second. Okay. Yeah, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Board recognition. Trustee Eubanks, I'm going to go first here with, with one. Um, so on behalf of the Coeur Public Schools and the Board of Trustees, we want to acknowledge and thank Josh Beebe and North, Northwest Realty and Associates for their generous donation of retail space at Harbor Plaza. The district utilized the space in November and December for reviewing and displaying sample English language art materials, as well as sorting more than 20,000 books for Jingle Books. 30,000. 30,000 books for Jingle Books, wow. We appreciate our community partners, and although Josh could not be here tonight, we want to take this opportunity to thank him publicly for his generosity. All right, Trustee Eubanks, you have uh, Invest, Inspire, Innovate, and Shining Stars. Yeah, each school to look get this on here I'm not quite with it yet hey each school month district 271 together with panhandle kiwanis and the cordelaine education partnership honors three exceptional educators in the district these folks consistently provide our kids with creative challenging and effective opportunities to learn every day for december 2017 our esteemed invest inspire and innovate award recipients are as follows uh, for elementary school, we have jo Joey Shoup, Joy Shoup, Dalton Elementary, fifth grade teacher, and? For um, middle school, we have Karina Selby, Woodland, seventh grade life science teacher. This one was pretty awesome. Um, usually we just go into the classroom but how Woodland is set up and all the, and with the seventh grade pod, all the teachers came out and all the students, and then we went in and got Mrs. Selby. It was actually uh, pretty awesome to have everyone there involved and get to see her and um, honor her. So that was a good experience. Yeah, and they all cheered and uh, Tears clapped. and yeah. all the good stuff. It was great, yeah. Hey, for our high school award, I assume that's next, uh, a totally amazing science teacher, Eric Carnes. 
uh, and we did this in his classroom. And by the way, we had our superintendent present through all of these, which was really cool. And then we have, we'll do it. Okay. Our shining star. Our shining star award goes to, I'm trying to find the one that goes with, oh, Victoria Michael, our yeah. communications assistant at the district office. She's absolutely amazing. If you haven't had the opportunity to meet her, I suggest you reach out to her and get to know her. She's a wonderful individual. Okay, we have a nice round of applause for all of these winners. Thank you. Ah. Uh, and saving the not the best for the last, but one additional one. Rob Mick uh, also is a Shining Star o Award winner. The Shining Star Award is given for classified employees who go above and beyond the, the call of duty. This is for Rob Mick, head warehouse worker at Nutrition Services. And let's give it up for Rob as well, okay? Okay, thank you both. Uh, it's time for our high school student body reports, and it is Fight for Fish Week, I believe, right? Is that right? So I'm going to go with Lake City first, since you have the fish. All right. Good evening, esteemed board chair, honor honorable trustees, Superintendent Olson, and district administration. My name is Peyton Barber, and I am the ASB treasurer at Lake City High School. Also with me tonight are the other ASB officers, President Valerie Lagososa, Vice President Kira Simpson, and Secretary Taylor Pickford. We've been busy at Lake City getting ready for Fight for the Fish this Friday, which we're glad to host again. Our students and staff are having a great time with our Spirit Week, and tomorrow we'll be begin our Kiss for the Fish fundraiser to raise money for the Human Rights Task Force to be presented during Fight for the Fish. This month, we'll also be hosting our X the Text game with Post Falls, sponsored by Allstate Insurance, which raises awareness for teens to not text and drive. We're also honored to be judges for this year's Battle for the Paddle between Sandpoint and Lakeland at the end of the month. During the next few weeks, our college and career advisor, Mr. Kincaid, will also be going into classrooms to help students interpret their PSAT results and discuss tips, including Khan Academy and other test prep applications that can help juniors prepare for the SAT coming up this April. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight, and we'll see you next month. Okay, thank you, and best of luck this weekend at Coeur d'Alene High School. Hi, I'm Rachel Dooley, the Coeur d'Alene High School ASB president, and these are our other ASB officers, Abby, Sarah, and Emily. Last month was really busy for us at Coeur d'Alene High School with classes participating in Adopt a Family, Holiday Spirit Week, and Student Council's preparation for Fight for the Fish. This month, CHS students are preparing for end of semester finals, which are at the end of this month on the 24th and 25th, um, and Student Council is excited and ready for Fight for the Fish this Friday. Spirit packs are being sold this week, and spirit days are taking place every day this week. That's why we're wearing this, so <laughs> apologies. <laughs> um, CHS has been somber over the past two weeks, as one of our students passed away over winter break. Counselors were present all over school last week, and many students went in to see them. This tragedy affected many of our students and staff, and it's been a rough few weeks. Please keep the affected family in your thoughts and prayers as they go through this tragic and painful loss. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from KTEC here tonight? Okay, and Venture couldn't be with us tonight, so we will move on. Bruce, that means you're up with the Coeur d'Alene Education Association report. All righty, thank you. Uh, board Chair, Board Members, Superintendent Olson, District Employees, thank you uh, once again for letting me be here to speak. Um, it's kind of crazy to think that we're almost to the halfway point. Um, it's just flying by, uh, but of course this is the long haul between now and spring break, so somehow we'll power through it. Um, first off though too, I would like to apologize to all the Green Bay fans out there. Um, I did draft 
uh, Aaron Rodgers, and apparently so did Mr. Steve Casey here. So maybe it was his fault that everything happened and jinxed it. But um, congratulations to the Minnesota Viking fans, though, and all that's going on that. Um, I would like to start off, though, by just saying, uh, talking about some really good things out there, uh, and in particular, the uh, c communication that's happening within our school district. Uh, the Mr. Scott Maben, and I apologize, I should have written it down, but his assistant uh, that was just named the Shining Star, uh, they are just doing an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, it seems like they are everywhere, all the time, uh, working social media fantastically. Um, you know, it's all the time on my Facebook feed. Uh, just always seeing Coeur d'Alene schools on there with something new, too. It's n not just the same stuff over and over, and so big hats off to them. Um, along the same line, Seth Denniston is doing a great job also with his technology updates that he mails out to the staff. Uh, I know that those are appreciated by the staff and are read and help out quite a bit, and so a huge thank you to them uh, going on. Um, to be honest, I kind of had, at first, had a hard time trying to really figure out what I was going to come up with to speak this month, and that always is a bit of a challenge for me. And I guess in a way that's a good thing because it means there's, I mean, it's always easy to talk about the bad stuff. Um, so there's not a whole lot of bad stuff going on. Um, but w when I did start going through the board packet, one thing did catch my eye. And I don't know if this is more of a statement or a question to the board, um, but the, the uh, copier, uh, shoot, what was it on there? There we go, the copier consultant services caught my eye um, and the expense at what that is at. And I know in the justification it says that we could save money, but I, I'm just curious if there's people in-house that could be doing that same work uh, without having to spend that extra $25,000 to try to save us money. Um, also within that statement, it did say that, you know, we don't know if just going out to bid will save us money or not. And so I don't know if that's gonna be discussed tonight or not. Um, but I just want to get out there that for myself as well as other people that I've talked to that that was a bit of concern with that expense. Um, also today I saw, just today, saw the article that we have 34 applicants for the superintendent position, which is fantastic. It means we have a lot of interest in what's going on with that. Um, along those lines, I would just, I know I've asked before, but I would ask again if the CEA could be part of that of going through the applicants and the hiring committee. Um, and so I'll just put that out there and ask again for that. Uh, the last thing I'd like to talk about, and uh, just kind of keep this kind of brief, I guess, because this is more on myself. I haven't spoken to really anybody else in the CEA about this, but I've been reading more and more uh, articles about research about when school starts later, especially the teenagers, how they do better that the teenage brain just does not function in the morning. And if you've ever been to a first period high school class, you would see that. Their brain is not functioning. Um, and so with that, I, I would just ask that perhaps the board could maybe look into that. I'm not asking for a big change anytime soon or possibly at all, but perhaps just kind of do a little bit of research on that. Because from what I've read, schools that have done that, their discipline problems go down, uh, their test scores go up, grades go up, it's just a happier environment all around, and it seems to be better for everybody, especially at the high school level when it starts even an hour later. So that is all I have for this week, and I don't know if you have any questions or not. No? All right, thank you. I'll just say, Bruce, Seth is probably the best one to answer your question in regards to the copier contract, so um, we can probably make sure he he gets you some of those answers. Okay. okay. So we are up for public comment now. I'd like to remind the public that while this is a meeting of the Board of Trustees that takes place in public, it is not a meeting with the public. It is a meeting of the board to conduct district business. The board does allow some limited public comment on district related items. Those wishing to address the board during the public comment period are limited to one comment not to exceed three minutes. If you have additional comments that you would like to present to the board, you may provide those comments in writing to the clerk of the board, Lynn Town. Ms. Town will ensure that the board members receive the additional commentary. Please keep in mind that the board members will not respond to public comment. If I've determined that an individual statement is, is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, or repetitive, 
I may terminate the speaker's privilege to address the board. Okay, first up is Roger Satterfield. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, welcome, sir. Thank you. I had to s smile when this gentleman talked about high school's students' brains not functioning. Mine doesn't function before coffee either, so <laughs> it's a common problem. It's adults and everybody. Uh, do you name my uh, name and address for the record or anything? No, sir. <laughs> okay. And by the way, thank you for your service. Um, I'm here tonight representing the Hayden City Council. I'm the president of the city council. And uh, first of all, before I get into my comments, I I'd like to say that we are very supportive of the school district and we understand that you've been looking for property in the city of Hayden to put a new school. And uh, my former life, I was a solid waste director for Kootenai County. I had to look for a lot of property. I've been looking for eight years for a senior center to put somewhere and, and I feel your pain. Very, very challenging. One of the options as we understand it is that you have um, designated the old Hayden School on the corner of Government Way and Hayden Avenue as a possibility for building a new school. And, and that's what I'd like to address. Traffic currently on Government Way and Hayden Avenue is terrible. There's times where the traffic clear down on Honeysuckle is backed up to Hayden and then from Hayden Avenue clear out to Miles. It's, it's horrible. <clears throat> it's one of, if not the busiest intersection in the city of Hayden. When Hayden Meadows, people drop their kids off or when school's out, Hayden Avenue also becomes a, a traffic nightmare. And it becomes very, very challenging for not only parents dropping off kids, but people going to work, going to lunch, uh, whatever. The city of Hayden is working on a plan now to improve that intersection and from Government Way to Highway 95 to improve that corridor. But because of parking issues and very limited right-of-way access, it's not gonna change much. You're gonna see sidewalks, that's, that's about it. And maybe the turn lanes may be a little bit wider and stuff, but that's been a, a huge problem in the city of, of Hayden is parking and right away, because if we take right away, then none of the businesses have parking. <clears throat> Future growth is also a concern because we don't have much growth north of Hayden Avenue right now, and it's, it's gonna come. We're, we're seeing growth like we've never seen before, especially with businesses. We feel that if you were to put a new school there because of traffic congestions, that may curtail some of the business opportunities that uh, people will explore. Bottom line, there's really no solutions for that intersection. I, I wish there was. We've been looking at it. I've been on council for 10 years. We've been looking at it uh, for a long time to improve that area. The other thing is, is the old school is about the only historical landmark left in this city of Hayden. And the people that we represent, they don't want to see that school go away. It, it's, it's become an icon, if you will. Um, I, it's not the school board's fault or anybody else's fault, really, that that is the only historical building left, but it, it's just a, a simple fact. It's Im important to our citizens um, um, to retain it if we can. Um, I forgot, I'm, I'm sorry, I was uh, negligent in introducing Matt Roeder. He's also a, a council member that's here tonight. Um, one of the other things, and I, I don't know how long all of you have been on the school board and stuff, um, I understand that the school has invested significant money in that old school uh, to bring it up to code because you've used it for a variety of reasons and stuff. 
And I, and, I, and I don't, again, I don't know how long you've been on the board, but when the Atlas School was built on Atlas, the city of Hayden and the school district had agreed to a trade for that property to build the Atlas School on, and in return, we would get the uh, old school. Uh, the night that that was to be inked, signed off, uh, Mr. Harry Amon came and informed the council that deal, the deal was off the table, which disappointed us very much because one of the things we had done in anticipation of this trade is we had bought the property north of the school, which we have an agreement with you folks currently to use it, I think, for a, a drop-off. And, and that property is important to the city of Hayden. <clears throat> I'm not going to say all of the council, even though I'm here representing the council, but we see that as someday that becoming a public parking lot because of our very limited parking for businesses, very limited access to the businesses that are there now. We may turn that, we're, we're going to talk about it, turn that into a public parking lot for the businesses that cannot provide ample parking to meet code. So I wanted to make you aware of that. And, and again, we're, we're committed to working with the school district to find property on the west side of 95. As we understand it, that's where you'd prefer to have it. Uh, we, we currently have a council member who knows everybody in Hayden, <laughs> all the property owners and everything. He is out there talking to these property owners to see if he can get someone to step forward and sell the school district if it's you know if it suits your needs of course so he's working very hard on that right now as a matter of fact i talked to him saturday and he was going to go out uh, today to to look at that so i guess the reason i'm here tonight the hayden city council is asking that the school board would please reconsider their consideration for building a new school at the corner of Government Way and Hayden Avenue. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being here tonight and thank you for what you do for the city of Hayden. Um, and uh, just to clarify, because I've had some questions today, but. Um, while property is on our discussion today, we will not be making a decision today on the Hayden Lake site. Um, and I believe Superintendent Olson might be meeting with Brett tomorrow just to discuss some of those issues you brought up. So, thank Does that you. Mean I can go home and watch <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, thank you. It, but you have to text in the scores. Yeah. You know, and, uh, have a good night. Okay, you're gonna to have to help me out on this. Is it? It's Hart, yeah. right? And your last name again? Hardell Pra. Hardell Pra. Thank you. All right. I know everyone asked this, but do I have to press the button, right? Oh no. It, oh, I'm on. Cool. <laughs> That's great. All right. I assume everyone's ready then. Esteemed members of the board. My name is Hart Pardo Pra, and I am currently enrolled in Coeur d'Alene High School as a senior. I am here today to discuss the phone policy that has been a long issue standing in our schools today. While I do believe that, school, uh, that phones are more of a distraction than a learning tool, you will not be able to get rid of them. They're in our culture as of now. Our students are grown up with basically a phone in their hands. So the problem that you'll be facing is making the perfect policy for phones. But here's the reality, you cannot make a perfect policy for phones. You can make the best policy that you can for this time right now. Now, phones are a necessary evil. Uh, parents use them in order to monitor their students and check up on them. Uh, coaches use them to quickly access, to give information to their team members which is quite efficient in my opinion, and some teachers do use them as an effective learning tool. Um, and then in the December meeting, uh, Mr. Eubanks, you stated that 
uh, Chromebooks could be used in place of phones, and I do believe that is 100% possible, but the example came up as a science experiment, of recording a science experiment to turn it in online. A Chromebook cannot practically be used to record a science experiment, at least the ones that we have at my school. The keyboard is strapped to the monitor and the camera is facing towards you. So in order to record that said science experiment, you'd have to face it like that, which I do not believe would be the safest thing for the computer because if it gets damaged, who has to pay for it? The school board. And I don't think the school board likes using more money than it needs to. Now, in crafting the perfect policy, uh, the policy brought up in December by Mr. Hearn over there, I do believe that it had a few good points in it. Uh, he stated that uh, teachers should be able to take their, uh, the students' phones, uh, turn them off, and put it uh, somewhere in a basket where the teacher could view it. I do not personally agree with the teacher needs to put in a basket where they can view it, but I do believe that they need to be turned off and not on their person in order, in order not to be distracted. I believe that they should be turned off and put in their bags, and then if a teacher would like to have their students use them, then tell them to go use them. Now on to the disciplinary policy that Mr. Hearn stated earlier in the December meeting. He said that the second violation uh, would consider a loss of phone use and a meeting with the parents and students on the phone policy. I do believe that the meeting with the parents and students on the phone policy would be a vital tool for this policy to implement because if uh, parents and students understand the policy, then it'll cause less problems. But then it later on stated that the phone would be lost for a year and after the third offense would be lost for the remainder of the school district time. <laughs> I mean, I find that completely and utterly outrageous and unpractical. I do not believe that you'll be able to keep a student from accessing their phone the entire time that they're in their school year. So my personal suggestion for the policy is have them turned off, not on their person, uh, used before, after school, and with teacher permission. And then it should also be stated that Mr. Eubanks said earlier in the December meeting that the phone policy was solved with the no phones by Canfield, the no phone policy, but you're dealing with middle schoolers who do not know the majority of the outside world like high schoolers. So if you are going to craft a policy of any kind, you should definitely differentiate between the school levels because that is important. And as I was stating, my personal suggestion, turned off, put away, used when teachers ask for them, and the violations, it should go, they do need to meet with their parents and faculty about the policy in order to understand it, and that they should get detention if they use it more than enough times. I'm thinking three and up, but that's my personal opinion. <laughs> and then for first violation or something, the teacher just takes it and give it back to them whenever at the end of the school day. And for that, I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Well done. Hey, Steve Casey. I'm not going next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Casey. Thank you, Chairman Morrison. So that young man, did he leave already? Yeah. Nice job. That's very difficult to do in a group like this. So congratulations. I'd like to pronounce your name, but I don't think I could. Just say Arkansas. OK, OK. Uh, members of the board, uh, Chair Morrison, Superintendent Olson, thank you. Happy New Year. We, uh, we do have a full slate, I think, in the next few months of things to tackle, that being one of them. So um, thank you so much for serving. We all know how much time you put in to that job with little if no thanks. But uh, thank you. It, it's, it's a hard job that you do. I'm going to read my comments because I have some uh, numbers in here, and I want to make sure I get them right. Chairman Morrisville, Superintendent Olson, members of the board. The Long Range Planning Committee met on December 11th at 4.30 p.m. in the Midtown Center. The first hour of our meeting was dedicated to hearing presentations from Chair Morrisville, Superintendent Olson, and Chris Shipley regarding land acquisition, current financial status regarding funding allocated to the purchase of land, and the construction of a new elementary school. Superintendent Olson also informed us of the conversations he has been having with our neighborhood uh, school districts from Post Falls and Lakeland school districts regarding school district boundaries. 
Throughout this presentation, the committee was encouraged to ask questions, and many did. The last 30 minutes of this meeting focused on the pros and cons of the three sites available for building the next elementary school. The sites included one, the Hayden Lake Center, now known as NEXA, on the corner of Government Way and Hayden. The second site is on the corner, southeast corner of Ramsey Road and Prairie Avenue. And the third site is on the corner of Government Way and Wyoming Avenue. At the conclusion of the question and answer period, Long Range Planning Committee members were asked to rank the sites based on what they heard and their personal opinion. First choice was awarded three points, second choice was awarded two points, and the third choice was rated with one point. Out of the 28 committee members that we have, there were seven absent. Out of the 21 present, 11 turned in their feedback forms. That left 10 outstanding. Superintendent Olson then stated that they had until December 20th to send their comments to the district office. Five members sent their comments to the district office. It is unclear is if they were votes or just simply comments, so it kind of skewed the voting, if you will. We prefer to uh, refer to it as feedback. Their comments were all over the board. There was no clear definitive choice indicated by the committee. Many of the comments, even from those that returned their feedback forms, didn't feel comfortable with their choice and requested more time to study the options. It is my hope, as the president of the Long Range Planning Committee, that the board delays any action regarding this topic until at least the February board meeting. The Long Range Planning Committee will meet again on January 22nd to once again review the information presented to them on 12-11. In addition, this will allow the district to pursue other options that may pre present themselves in the interim, at least between now and the February board meeting. This decision that we're about to make soon is of utmost importance to our community and should not be approached hastily. We will be investing millions of dollars in the, for the long term of our, of our school district. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd answer any questions if you have any regarding Long Range Planning Committee. Seeing none, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Casey. Just barely over three minutes. You're getting better. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, didn't have to get the hook out today. Uh, okay, next is Janelle Murphy. Good evening. My name is Janelle Murphy. I've been a paraprofessional for eight years with the district and six years I have assisted students with wheelchairs. This year has been incredibly challenging due to the con having to constantly come up with alternative ways to move my student and myself around the building safely. I have a great amount of support from the staff, but this year some important things have come up and I've been told that we can only do so much and that the board is aware of these problems. I don't feel like you really do know and that you fully understand how the challenges there are unless you have been the one pushing the chair, walking with the student, carrying the student, changing the student in the bathroom that does not support the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, or feeding the student, to just name a few. I work with a student who spends part-time in life skills and part-time in kindergarten. They have the same goals as their peers in kindergarten. Just getting into the classroom is a whole lot of work. We have two options because the option we were using doesn't work no longer now that there's snow on the ground. The first option we can use is the chairlift, which requires a minimum of three adults. The challenge is finding three adults available, and especially in a moment's notice, for example, if the student needs to use the bathroom. The second is the route we normally use right now. After dressing for the weather, we exit the double doors to the playground, which are not automatic, then I push or pull the wheelchair, depending if there is snow in between the two buildings, up a hill to the gate that needs to be unlocked, then locked again, then to the front of the building. Once inside, the wheelchair is left in the hall simply because of the size of the classroom. From there, the student can sit on the carpet, a chair, or lean on a table along the side of her peers. Should the student need to use the bathroom or need to be changed, the student is then bundled back up, placed in the chair as we travel outside 
through the gate between the two buildings, open the double doors that again are not automatic. And I wanted to add that the um, from the back of the wheelchair to the front today, I measured is 50 inches. Um, and then we hope that no one is in line in that restroom. Once inside, there is just barely enough room to turn the wheelchair and put on the brakes. Then after gathering supplies, there is nowhere to put them. And I have to be sure that my cell phone is in my pocket because no one can hear us if we need help. The student is between 40 and 50 pounds, is lifted 36 inches onto a wall-mounted table that does not support the student's body. Today, I measured she hangs off 10 inches. Therefore, I'm extremely cautious of her head sliding off while I lift or reach for anything, then trying to get to the sink and paper towels with the wheelchair in front of them is hard. The only automatic doors in the building are in the front entrance, not where the bus picks up and drops off, not the doors leading to the playground, or the door to speech services, and definitely not out to the art and music room. Automatic doors are more important than you think. Most students in wheelchairs have some, some sort of communication device. The student I work uses an eye gaze program where this allows her to speak with her eyes. If myself or anyone does not get the wheelchair turned around and through the doors before the door closes, it would be tragic. The student would lose her form of communication and it would be extremely expensive to repair. And her parents said the whole system costs around $30,000. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I do want to share that transporting the student to the third building to attend music and art is completely new set of challenges. If weather permits, I can push the chair out to the playground, but then it's left empty and anything could happen to it. The snow and the ice, with snow and ice, my coworkers and I take turns carrying the student from the life skills classroom through the double doors out to the playground onto the gravel and up the stairs to the building. This is very physical and can only be done by one person because the entrance of the gate and the building are only so wide. Now I would just appreciate if you as a board would take these con concerns into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Um, I see it in the notes here, but I don't think you stated it. Can, what school are you at? I'm at Nexa. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Okay, Mr. Rutherford. Good evening, um, Board Chair Morris Rowe, um, Dr. Olson, Board members. Um, you have a hard job. I've been I've been not in your shoes, but listening to the conversations around what you have to do around purchasing property for the school that I'm principal of, Northwest Expedition Academy, and sitting in your shoes, I don't know what I would do. Um, and I also am on long range planning, so I hear those conversations. And I hear the passion and the desire and the drive behind um, what people really believe, not selfishly what's best for them, but what's best for our children and what's best for our community. And, and it's, it's a hard decision. And I'm stuck. I hear, um, I hear the, the chamber conversation. Um, I, I, it would have been awesome to hear that conversation before tonight, because that's not the conversation I've heard in the past. Um, and my feeling is we're an expedition academy, which we, we expedite, we get out and we move around our community and we become part of our community. So for, for the children that go to my school, the school that I'm principal of, uh, being at the site of Hayden Lake Elementary School, Northwest Expedition Academy, um, is an amazing location for us. We're part of the community. We walk the community, we're able to walk to Avondale Lake, Hayden Lake, uh, City Hall, where we visited more than once, um, to 95 to pick up garbage, to do lots of other work around our community, and we're giving back to the community of Hayden. My biggest fear is that we'll be placed in a position where we won't have that opportunity. Uh, so to be placed in a, it, it, where we're not around places that we can get out of our building, where we'd have to be bused everywhere we go would be, I think, um, it wouldn't be tragic. We'd make it work. We'd make anything work. Um, but it'd be difficult. And, and it wouldn't give us the opportunities that we have in, in our community right now. So, so I, I guess my desire is that, and I've talked to you all individually, is that I, I, I want to respect the job that you have to do. And, and I was going to be a lot more passionate about my ideas and thoughts of Hayden Lake Elementary School this morning or this evening. Um, 
but I also understand that there's other decisions to make too. And, and my hope, my desire is that you also, you, you don't just look at the school as a building, you look at it as, um, as a building that has kids that learn differently and need to explore, need to get outside their building, need to be in their community and need to do great work. So again, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Ann Cohn. Hi. Good evening. Chairman, Superintendent, esteemed board members, I'm here to speak uh, just briefly on the policy that you're considering. I know you're not voting tonight on the cell phone policy. I'm a parent of a sophomore um, at uh, Coeur High School. He's come up, been uh, through the entire school district, even though my address indicates we do live in Post Falls. I'm gracious and thankful for the opportunity for him to attend Coeur d'Alene schools. Um, throughout this, throughout his learning um, and learning time here, he's been an advanced student. Uh, he excels, he's got enough credits at the end of this year that to graduate as a sophomore if he chose to, he chooses to stay and continue his education. He uses his phone currently sometimes as a learning tool if it's allowed by the teacher. We have a policy in our home, if the teacher doesn't want it out, it's in your pocket. But I spoke, I'm speaking to you, I just took Alice training, I'm not for sure if any of you are familiar with that. It's a training on um, active shooters. I just took that this weekend in live action drills, well, live action and using airsoft guns. But the my role in that, almost every time we had a drill, was to make the phone call to 911. And what I learned throughout my training not only this, but my online training was, don't assume anybody else is gonna make that call to 911. I know our schools cannot be as secure as we would like them to be. There are lots of entrances, especially at Coeur High School, students coming and going to different learning opportunities, whether it be down to NIC, whether it be out to KTAC, whether it be, we have you know um, middle schoolers coming up at different times. So there's students going in and out. So we can't be as secure as we would always like to be. That being the case, if we take away the cell phones and we put them in the backpacks and we put them in the lockers of our high school students, in particular where it is more fr free-flowing access, we take away a tool that they can use to, to uh, uh, alert. That also I learned this, this weekend during my Alice training can be used if you need to counter. It can be thrown at somebody, which then they aren't holding their guns, their things are being thrown at them. So I'd like you to consider, like the gentleman said, there can't be a one size fits all. While the policy may be one thing for elementary, another thing for middle school, another thing for high school, having that phone on their person off, or at least on silent, and, and in the classroom with them, not only can be a learning tool, it can also be a safety tool that they can use. So I ask you to consider that when it comes time to a vote. Thank you very much for all that you guys do. I appreciate your service. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cohn. Derek Colas. He just can't get enough of us. Thank you for nice very, very you. much for allowing me to speak. It's nice to see you guys, too. I've, I've missed you a little bit, <laughs> honestly. Um, I'm not going to take up very much of your time. Uh, I do want to thank you all for your service. Um, Superintendent Olson has been uh, very, very good at communicating, but I do want to uh, bring something to your attention because it was brought to my attention. Um, at the beginning of the year, the Certified Advisory uh, Council was disassembled. Um, it was eliminated. And that was an avenue for not just the CEA, but for teachers throughout the district to have access to the, to the superintendent and provide him with input. It's also in our master articles as a required element. Now, I would say that Superintendent Olson has done a great job of getting out. He visited the CEA at one of our, our uh, monthly meetings, um, and he's been going around ga gaining information from all kinds of stakeholders. Um, if you want the reference, it's Article 4, Section 5, uh, Part B, and it doesn't specifically reference that council, but that council did meet that requirement. So it's not named in the, art in the articles. Um, I hope that there is an easy fix to this. 
Uh, I'm sure that there is because we're capable and talented people committed to, to fulfilling our obligations, but I did want to bring that to your attention tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Colas. And next up, Ben Gabby. Thank you. Well, I'm here as a, as a parent of, um, I'll get emotional, I apologize, um, a fifth grade boy who goes to uh, Northwest Expedition Academy. And I'll tell you the, the struggle I've had for the past five years as a parent, uh, my wife and I, trying to find an educational solution that works for my child. And it wasn't until uh, last summer that we discovered uh, the Nexus School and Mr. Rutherford and the uh, project-based learning programs that uh, he is spearheading there. For the past five years in my oldest's education, he has hated school point blankly. And it has been a fight. It has been a major source of contention in our home. I share this because I want to let everyone here know in the district and the, the board especially that the programs, these project the project-based learning program was instrumental in not only helping my oldest child but my, all the rest of my children as well. We moved all of them to the school because we had, we, we had hopes that this program would be something that would help my, my son who is a, a non-traditional learner and he's a very hands-on on young man. And I'll tell you that not two weeks after starting the school year, I picked him up from school and he said, Dad, I love this school. I love this program. I can't wait to see what else it has to offer. And I give you that as a background because as I look at these three words on this wall, inspire, innovate, and invest, I think about my son and my other children behind him. And I think about the location of the Northwest Expedition Academy and how vital it will be to have it in a place that will provide those opportunities to the, to the children that will benefit from it like my son does. And so as I stand before you, I, I request humbly that you strongly consider the Hayden Lake location that it's currently in to be the permanent location for the new school. And as Mr. Rutherford already articulated the benefits of that location from a logistics standpoint, I wanted to add a little color from a student standpoint that I feel strongly that if you were to, to remove it from the city, you remove a lot of that, that benefit, that opportunity to inspire, to innovate, and to invest in these, in these young students' lives. And it's my request that, and I'll add to any of the other voices that have already been that, that the location be at the Hayden Lakes uh, facility or, or uh, area uh, so they can take advantage of all the opportunities that are so close by. And um, just appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gabby. Okay, that's our list for today on public comments. Dr. Olson, uh, you're up with your superintendent report. Uh, thank you, Chairman Morris Rowe. Um, three quick items in the superintendent's report tonight, and they are uh, touch point dates that I'd like to bring to the attention or remind uh, members of the board. They've uh, probably uh, seen these dates and uh, these meetings on calendars uh, for the last several months, but. Uh, just a note of reminder, um, three key meetings coming up. One is January 24th of 18. Um, we are going to be combining a board staff uh, interest-based bargaining workshop. Uh, this was a discussion, interestingly, that came from an interface with our, our CEA colleagues uh, that had talked about uh, the prospect of perhaps doing uh, contract negotiations and general bargaining discussions uh, in a different way, uh, to take a look beyond the traditional approaches into a more interest-based approach and an ongoing approach in the district. So we've asked uh, some colleagues uh, who are familiar uh, to not only the Coeur d'Alene Education Association, but to the school district, 
uh, to come and work with us. Uh, one of them is a uh, UNICEF uh, person for the Idaho Education Association, Kathy Yamamoto, and the other is a, a former um, BEA, this was the Boise Education Association president, as well as an IEA treasurer, uh, and in a later point in his life, the human resources director for the Boise School District, a man by the name of Blaz Teleria. Um, uh, they are very excited the, uh, to be able to come and join us in this effort. Um, have done this in a number of settings, uh, not only in Idaho, but in different places around the country. Uh, and welcome the opportunity to have that interface with us. So that's uh, the 24th, and I think we've got our roster set. The board will be represented. Um, we solicited participation, and uh, Mr. Hearn and Mr. Morris Rowe had indicated uh, they're willing <laughs> to, de <laughs> to deal with another all-day workshop. Uh, and uh, uh, we've, we've got them. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot to mention that. Uh, we've got them rostered already. Second item uh, is the um, 19th of um, January. Uh, this is a, a meeting that'll run from approximately nine until two, and it's what we call a mid-session or mid-year budget workshop. Um, with changes in our leadership and facilities, operations, and budget, um, and um, an interim superintendent and uh, being on the threshold of a, um, interviewing and selecting a new superintendent, um, we have come together and uh, decided to take a mid-year look at our budget. Uh, we want not only to look at the budget, but we want to look at the history of the budget process in the district, how we got uh, where we are today and of course in this fiscal year how we got to where we are uh, in January 2018. Uh, we'll be talking about again the budget process, revenues, expenditures, uh, funding sources. Um, we'll also talk about uh, uh, actually uh, we're going to try to make a gosh awful experience in learning about the school funding formula into a, a, an interesting experience that everyone can understand. Um, and then talk about um, next steps and stages of the budget process, a budget calendar where there are touch points throughout the year where the board and community can engage the staff uh, in the budget process, where we are, where we're going, uh, how we're spending, um, and so on and so forth. So anyone in the audience uh, um, certainly could join us for that experience. It is a board meeting, uh, but this is a board staff community meeting, and we uh, very much um, recommend participation, uh, encourage enthusiastically participation from the Coeur d'Alene Education Association, uh, representatives of our employee groups, so again, they can become more familiar with uh, where we are in the budget. Um, we'll be sending out more information. We are in the throes of wrapping up an agenda uh, and trying to uh, create a situation where we can cover it in a reasonable period of time. If not, if it spills over, we'll ask the permission of the board to continue in a different uh, uh, venue at a, at a later time. Uh, third area is um, Data Summit 3.0, uh, and that is uh, February 21st. Um, many of you in this room have been participants in the budget summit process. One, uh, we believe, would start and finished in a single meeting, and we're surprised to find that uh, nothing could be further from the truth in terms of our coverage, and more importantly, in terms of interest from board, staff, and community to understanding uh, the broad picture that, that basically underpins our performance as a school district. Um, our plan for the third meeting is to um, bring um, uh, conclusions and recommendations uh, to some of the experiences we had, answer some of the questions that did not get covered or answered in previous sessions, and uh, basically uh, profile next steps and stages to the ongoing process of performance improvement. So those are three key meetings. There's lots more to talk about, but in the interest of uh, our agenda, um, we'll talk about them at a later time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Olson. And board comments. Uh, Trustee Eubanks, you have some comments on the uh, Jingle Books? Program. Yes, I do. I have a couple. Yeah. 
Hey, Jingle Books 2017, a volunteer effort to help improve early childhood literacy in our community has now ended, resulting in every single kindergarten, first, second, and third grader in District 271, which is more than 3,000 children, or about one-third of our district's entire enrollment, getting their choice of six new or gently used reading books to take home, read, keep, and read again and again and again. Current third graders, if they have been in our district since starting kindergarten, have received at no cost to the taxpayer a four-year total of at least 21 different reading books from Jingle Books. And this year's overall community donation of some 30,000 children's books added to the 85,000 donated in the first three years of our program amounts to some 115,000 kids' books gifted to our littlest learners since we began in 2014. And just so you know, collecting thousands of donated books is one thing. Getting them all sorted, counted, boxed, and delivered to our 11 elementary schools is quite another. Assessing each book's grade level, pulling out the damaged books, the adult and religious books, the auto repair manuals and such, takes hundreds of man hours, especially with 30,000 books in the process. This year, Two individuals alone took it upon themselves, working tirelessly and selflessly for more than a month to get the job done. It's, safe to, it's a safe bet to make that right now, somewhere in the homes of every kindergarten, first, second, and third grader in our district, there is a stack of treasured reading books that has passed through the loving hands and scrutiny of Norm and Diana Gissel. Okay? And at this time, I would like to ask, though I know they don't want to do this, I would like to ask Norm and Diana to come up. We want to recognize you for this phenomenal job. <laughs> and I, don't gag. for coming up. So we'd like to recognize Norm and Diana Gissel for their dedication to this year's Jingle Books Drive, a wonderful partnership first imagined by Dave Eubanks and Norm's daughter, daughter Greta Gissel. We discovered that Norm and his wife, Diana Gissel, were responsible for nearly single-handedly sorting 27,000 books given to Coeur d'Alene Public School students this December. For that reason, we'd like to declare Norm and Diana to be expert book sorters <laughs> <laughs> and present them with this trophy as a warm thank you. Their labors have helped to ensure that kindergarten through third grade students in our district have had the opportunity to select six books of their very own enhancing literacy efforts across our district. Thank you, Norm and Diana. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Say something. You bet. There is, we, my wife and I have discovered a new illness. It's a dementia induced by constant exposure to overwhelming cuteness. <laughs> Stewie the dog, Clifford the dog, Biscuit the dog, and the ugly cat, and God knows what else. It just goes on and on. We've had a wonderful time. We really enjoyed it this year. It was an excellent collection of books, many, many more new books, and books in excellent very excellent condition this year. But we really appreciate it and we're, as much fun as it was and as much joy as we had out of this, it's for a very, very serious purpose, is to make sure that our little children have all the opportunities that everybody in this room has had. Um, literacy is just fundamental to the American way of life and to, to participate in that great journey of these little children learning to read has really been an honor for us. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I went to Fernand that, 
on one day to watch the kids pick up their books. They were so excited. Their faces just lit up with happiness and picking up books, then going to each other, sitting down on the floor and showing everybody what they got. Oh, I have that. I'm going to go get another one. They come and ask, can I change it? Sure. Some of them even ask if they could take a book for their mother to read because they can't read it. It's the third grade. And we said, sure, they took it because the mother's going to be reading to, to them. It was awesome. Thank you. Also, I'd just like to say thank you, Trustee Eubanks. You've uh, been a, a big sp spearheader of this project. So thank you for all the extra time you've put in You're to this. It's been a labor of love. OK, so we are on to our consent agenda here, folks. And uh, it's we've got a couple changes here that we're going to make to it. So earlier, if you recall, I added, uh, we amended the agenda and added item 11, which was the Lake City travel. Uh, item A, uh, we had, uh, not all the information was in the packet, so we're going to pull that out of today's consent agenda. And then items G and H, which were a MOA and a MOU, um, are going to come back to us next month. Um, it, so we'll see those. So is there a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? without items A, G, and H. So moved. Adding L. Oh, and adding L, thank you. So moved again. <laughs> second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye, any opposed? Okay. Mr. Herringer, we are ready for you, sir. Welcome. Uh, good evening, Chairman Morris Rowe and uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is Eric Herringer. I'm with Piper Jaffray. I, uh, I am currently serving as the financial advisor to the school district and have in that, uh, been in that capacity the last few years. Uh, the firm I work for, Piper Jaffray, has worked on your uh, bond issues, the 2012 as well as the two 2017 bond election and, and then uh, executing the bond sale. What I wanted to review tonight, and I know this has been in your packet, you've had a chance to read it, and it, it might be a little bit thick. Uh, it's, it's only five pages, but the, the concept is, is, is a little meaty in terms of um, getting into the, the finance uh, situation around re repaying your bonds. But, but it really all comes down to sort of this, and I'm going to walk through the, the major sections. The, the background here, it, it really starts with when the district last passed its bond, it communicated to the taxpayers, the voters, that if the bond passed, that the tax rate per thousand would not go above uh, the $2.32 that was the, the tax rate in place uh, the year that bond was passed in 2017. And th the idea being that, it, that the district long range, when we worked to put that plan together, could keep the tax rate at 232 and be able to meet future funding needs that we'd modeled out not just that one bond issue but uh, potential bond issues in the next uh, 10 to 15 years or, and or uh, other funding such as like a plant levy but there's some flexibility there but point being uh, some long-range funding flexibility for the district at that two dollars and 32 cents so um, that is background and how do i scroll through this i just ask Okay, yeah, and I don't expect everyone to, to read this, but in terms of this background section, so the reason we're talking about a, a potential uh, action is that you have built up about two and a half million dollars of uh, uh, reserves, if you will, in your bond fund, and that's money that's been collected from property taxes to repay your bonds. It can only be used to repay bonds. It cannot be transferred over to the general fund. Um, but under Idaho code, you're allowed to levy for your bonds up to 21 months worth of bond payments, less what you have in your bond fund. 
So why does that matter? Well, once you build up a big reserve, you can no longer levy to, to maintain this tax rate at $2.32. And if you leave that reserve in place, then eventually that tax rate is going to drop, which might not necessarily seem like a bad thing, and, and, and having taxes go down isn't necessarily a, a bad thing, but it would be sort of a temporary drop if the district wanted to then come back and look at those funding needs that were modeled out in the next three to five, seven years. And so, so that's kind of the, the, the discussion is I wanted to bring this to the district's attention because we had talked about keeping the tax rate level, talked about these other uh, funding needs, but as it stands right now, unless you were to de defease some bonds with this two and a half million, uh, the tax rate would drop and then it would be a, sort of a climb back uh, with those future funding needs. Does that kind of make sense as a background? So as we go through, we say, so what is, you know, that's really the choice here is you could take some of this money and pay your debt off more quickly, this two and a half million, which was sort of how we had envisioned the plan if you stayed at a level tax rate when we did the modeling or keep that money in reserve and let the tax rate drop. So those are the kind of the, the two outcomes uh, if you do something or don't do something. So what is a defeasance? Because the process for getting this money out of your bond fund to paying down the debt quicker is what we call a defeasance. And it's really the process of setting aside money you have on hand now into an escrow held by a, a corporate trustee bank. And, and it's an irrevocable deposit of that money. And you're saying, take this money, Use it to make the payments on, a, on, these, on specific bonds that mature in the future and, and pay those bonds off at the earliest possible redemption date. So you're basically setting it aside. And from a CPA standpoint, I look at, at Chris, the, once you do a defeasance the, you know, in your audit, those, those bonds that you defease, you set money aside for, are no longer an obligation of the district. They officially, legally become an obligation of the escrow account. And that escrow accounts invested in U.S. Treasury securities. So, it's a it's a it's a way to set the money aside and and dedicate it to paying off your debt quicker. That's essentially what a defeasance is. So, if I look at your, you have two bond issues outstanding. You see that there's a schedule there uh, that shows the 2012 bonds and the 2017 bonds, and you could you basically look at the 2012 bond issue. And those shaded maturities are bonds that you can pay off early. So the bonds that mature in 2023, 2024, and 2025. And the principal amount in the principal column adds up to almost 7.7 .7 million. So those are the, the bonds that you could pay off early, the most efficient bonds that you could pay off early. And if we keep moving through, so again, why? Why do fees? Um, and I'll show you the economics of, of it. One, it can save some money because you're, you're going to be paying down the debt quicker. But two, it, it, uh, it is a way to maintain uh, the tax rate uh, to provide future flexibility for the district. And the alternative being that you have a temporary drop in the tax rate, and then when you need to look at other funding measures, it's got to go back up. Uh, so you get this sort of up and down. And it's tough to, to get bonds passed when it's a two-thirds supermajority, and this is a, a, a technique or mechanism to make that um, less challenging. So if you look down at the, if you can scroll up a little bit more, the savings available to the district if you were to defease uh, bonds with about two and a half million is about 2.8 million of total savings. But you get that by setting, you already have two and a half million. Right. So you have to subtract to be the two and a half million from the 2.8. So effectively $350,000 or so of savings and lower payments that you don't have to uh, make uh, by doing the defeasance. If you can scroll that down just a little bit the other way. So this left hand column of the current payments. Those are the bond payments that are being made right now on the 2012 issue if you don't do anything. The 
defeasance column is what we would suggest if you were to take the two and a half million and set it aside, you'd pay off 730,000 of principal in 2023, 730,000 in 2024, and 735,000 in 2025. So that'd be money set aside officially to pay off those bonds. Uh, and if I owned those bonds, so let's, so let's say I own the bonds in 2025, and you defeat them, I would no longer have uh, a security interest in the district's property tax levy. I'd have a security interest in this escrow that was set aside to pay me. The district would no longer need to deliver that in the future 735000 of principal because the escrow would pay it. Now, you start saving money right away because the escrow not only has, is going to redeem the principal amount, but it's also going to make the interest payments between now or when you set the money aside and the actual date that the bonds are redeemed, which is not until 2022. So the money sits in escrow between now and 2022. It's invested in U.S. Treasury securities, so it is earning interest. But then in 2022, it actually pays those bonds off quicker. So that's how your bonds that would have otherwise matured in 2025 are paid off in 2022. Everyone still with me? Okay. And then you see the savings in the far right column. Uh, so you save about 47,000 every six months, or call it almost 100,000 a year until you get out to 2023, 20, 24, and 25, and then the payments go down. And the nice thing about that too is that your, your, the amount that you actually have to levy come 2023, 20, 24, 25 is lower for your existing bonds. So if you do have another bond issue, you have more room to layer an amortization of that new future bond issue. Okay. So if I get to what to consider in a defeasance. So first of all, you have to decide, I mean, in terms of the next steps is should the district do a defeasance, right? That's question number one. And if you do, well, where, how do you want to utilize the savings? Where do you want to concentrate? I just presented, presented an idea where you put, spread it out over those last three years. You could put it all in the last year. Some of that has to do with what's the timing of your next funding needs. When are you thinking about going out uh, for a, a future bond or uh, plant levy? So those are things to consider. I don't know the answers, but if that was where the district wanted to go, we could come up with some options and some answers to look at. So the choice really is to do nothing. Just, you know, hey, this is great information, Eric. We like what we got going on. Let's go ahead, let's keep the money in place and let the tax rate drop and, uh, and, and not uh, set that money aside to pay the debt off quicker. We'll just, you know, pay it as the bond payments come due and lower the tax rate. Or to defease bonds, in which case you can save that $350,000 and keep the tax rate a little more level uh, rather than having it drop uh, significantly over the next couple of years. So the next steps are, again, to determine if the defeasance is the appropriate thing for the district, um, which would, the official action to do that would be through a resolution. You would take official action to set the money aside. We'd work with uh, your uh, paying agent trustee, which is U.S. Bank, to, to get the money set aside, uh, get all those documents in order, and, and execute that. But really, it would be one board meeting to approve the resolution, and then we take care of the rest. It's something you'd want to do if you were going to do, probably prior to the budget process, uh, it, before it's adopted in May. So you have some time here to, to consider that. Okay. And then the final piece here is just, I think, I gave you a lot of words and I said a lot of words and I, I should have probably just started out with a picture, which is this graph, which really can um, sort of illustrate the long, the sort of long range levy plan that, that we have been working on with the district for the last five to seven years. And that is to, again, try to keep this relatively level, stable tax rate. And so what this graph does is it, it maps out what you're existing in 2000, 18 levies look like. So you've got your supplemental levy, that's the, the bigger chunk, the roughly 16 million. You've got a little bit of an, a, 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 I think it's an emergency, a small emergency, maybe a little bit of tort levy. And then you've got the 2012 bond, which is the gray bars, 
and then the 2017, which is the, the gold. And if you just look at the gold and gray, um, you can see how the gold is layered uh, after the 2012 bond is paid off. Your 2012 bond was a 13-year maturity. Most bonds are 30 or 20-year maturities. And the 2017 was a 16-year, or no, I'm sorry, 14-year term. So you, you have short debt, right? That's something that the district really has done over the years is, is to try to keep its debt short, save interest costs. So the idea of shortening it even further is consistent with uh, what, how the district's managed its debt. But that white space, so that line that goes across the top, that line is a the, what I call the revenue line. It's, it's what the existing $2.31 tax rate, you know, you, it would produce under a very conservative growth uh, projection for your market value. So this assumes your market value grows at 2% uh, for 2019 and 2020, and then 1% after. And, and so you have a up, somewhat upward sloping revenue line uh, and that white space that's between the top of the bar chart and the revenue line is your capacity, if you will, to consider other funding measures. And that's what we're trying to sort of maintain or protect. So if we do the defeasance, then we're gonna take some money uh, that's been built up and lower the payments, lower the gold bars there in 23, 24, and 25. Uh, and then that just creates a little more of that so-called white space uh, for future needs. So hopefully that is a, provides another way to look at uh, what I've been describing. I'm going to stop, see if there are questions. And uh, um, I'm sure glad you understand this because <laughs> this is a little, uh, you said it's a little thick and it's not something I have a lot of understanding of. I guess uh, I guess I have two things. One, first of all, do you, do you have a recommendation? It sounds like you're, you're saying you're not necessarily recommending defe defeasance or not, right? I would say that my, thank you for the question. My recommendation is if you want to continue to execute the, the long range plan that was established going into the 2017 election, I would say do the defeasance. Okay. Um, and, and, and you certainly have the legal authority to do it. It's, it's well within what you promised uh, and communicated to your voters about the, the tax rate, that the tax rate would not go above $2.32. And it actually is 231. I know that's a small drop, but you, you'd keep it there and not go above that 232. And the negative to doing that is what again? I, I, I guess when I, I'll tell you, in my thick headedness, I like to have kind of decision like, you know, yep. these are the pluses and the minuses on both decisions. And then, I, you know, that helps me to to have that kind of a visual like yeah. that. And it really comes down to that little section there called the, you know, the choice, right? So okay. you, you don't do anything and, and you get the benefit of having the tax rate drop. So right now it's at 231 and we're projecting it could drop somewhere into the range of 220 to $2.03. So, but, but then that would be, if you did another funding election, you'd have to then talk about going back up to that two, 30 to 231 level. So it's a, it's, a, it's a drop, but it might be a temporary drop. Okay. And so, so, so that's the drawback, or I, mean, I should say, that's the alternative. The, the, the reason not to do the defeasance is if you want sort of that immediate reduction in the tax rate. Okay, and we could also choose, of course, to raise the, the tax rate too. If, if I know that's something that boards are not real comfortable doing, but it's, it is a choice we would have for a future bond election. Correct. Right, to significantly increase funding, right. possibly. Just technically, we don't control the bond rate, we, or the, the tax rate, we just control how much um, we levy, right? Yeah, okay. Or how much we're asking for, and then the, the rate's set. I, I guess in this issue, instance, we kind of can control the, the rate a little bit, maybe. That, that's correct. I mean, the, the tax rate's set by the county, but we can, we can model out what this looks like under what I would say for very conservative growth assumptions, so using that 2% that for the next couple of years. You've had 8 9% growth in your market value, which is what has allowed your tax rate to get down this low. Um, it's one of the lower tax rates in the, for school districts in the region. Go ahead. Um, 
so we call it debt cash flow savings, and we're referring to it as district savings, but isn't it essentially taxpayer savings because we're saving them money in the long run by paying off interest on these bonds? Correct. No, that's a good, that's a good point. It, whatever savings you are, are, you know, again, when you collect property tax for bonds, it can only be used to repay bonds. So once you save that money, it's just money that you no longer need to collect to repay the bonds. So it's money that it is absolutely taxpayer savings okay. uh, that, that will occur. It's 350000 less than needs to be collected. Than they would have paid if we decided to do nothing. Um, and then I guess if we review our long-range planning, and we'll do that in the spring, and we determine that we will need future facilities, what would be your recommendation? Would it be then to go ahead and defeat so that'll give us the opportunity to run another bond if we needed to, let's say 2023, 2024? Yes, that would be my recommendation would be if the district believes it still has funding needs for capital, mm -hmm. then I would recommend doing this because one, it saves some money. It's not a huge amount of savings in the grand scheme of things, so. but it saves money. It allows you to pay down your debt quicker, which is consistent with what the district has historically done. Right. And, and that just gives you in a better position to do your next funding measure. So if we were a district where we knew our, we didn't have any future capital construction needs, then you would say, go ahead and do nothing, let your rate drop sure, back ab down. Absolutely. But knowing, you know, if we decide in the spring, we know that there's growth occurring in our district and we will need new facilities, this would be the best way to ensure that we possibly could run a future bond? Yeah, I mean, you can always run a future bond. But keeping our rates stable. But it, help, it helps execute that plan. The two and a half million was accumulated over time. Is that correct? Correct. Last yeah, it's a, it's a, it's accumulated over. Even, some of that's related to the 2012 bond, um, and that's the same. You have one bond fund for both bonds, and so if we would have known, so the, the, you know, this is the other way I look at it too. If we would have had a perfect crystal ball about how much growth you were going to have over the last two years, we would have structured your payments as higher payments, so you wouldn't have had this you know, excess, and we would just utilize that to pay the debt off quicker. I mean, if we, again, I think this school board historically has said we want to pay our debt off as quick as possible. So if I had a perfect crystal ball, I would have said, okay, let's do a 10-year bond, right? But we had to also balance that with we don't know how much revenue is going to come in, and we are trying to keep our tax rate increase as low as possible when the bond's passed. We had to be a little conservative. So we're we're kind of balancing those two aspects. Okay, so we would be paying this money down, but then it's it's going to accumulate again. Is that correct? Over the next, it is likely to, it, until you do another funding measure. Correct. And so the if we do the the feasance and adopt a resolution, is that a one-time resolution? So we're just dealing with this. Correct. Sir, the yeah, this is just this, very specific to this. And, and it identifies specifically what maturities you you would defuse. Okay. And then I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Heron? Okay. And and thank you. I, I think all we're, we're looking for is some direction on whether this is something that we want to come back with and, and have, have the resolutions put together to do it or or not. Or are we ready to kind of give some direction on that tonight? Are you looking for something just in the near future? You said we have some time. Yeah, I think you've got a, a you know, so it, again, I'd, I'd want you to, if you were going to do it, I'd, I'd want to have it done by the time you adopt your budget. So, you know, you've got a couple months. Okay. Should we revisit this in a month or so? Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ship Mr. Shipley, you are up, sir. All right. Thank you, Eric. Well, I'm pumped. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll go fairly quickly through our finance. I have pulled up. I'm on the same page as you guys. <clears throat> so 
I'm gonna put it on a different screen. Are you gonna go finance nope, first? No, I got it right here. Yeah, right here. Finance first? Got it right here. Okay, so the budget status report, and <clears throat> if you're looking at this, um, same one that we've had month over month, and if you're looking at this and wondering, like, I would love to have more information on what these numbers mean and how this is put together, <clears throat> I have a date for you. <laughs> it's already been, been mentioned, but I want to keep selling this on uh, our budget workshop. Um, if, if I wanted to point out one thing here to you guys down would be towards the, the, the third box here, uh, middle column, uh, our excess of revenues, uh, we got 19 million. Again, that's just a reminder of that the state, when they make payments to the school district, uh, they don't make smooth payments month over month over month. They they come in front loaded, fairly heavy, and then uh, throughout the year they they make those up. So that's why our our fund balance currently is at 24 million 391 thousand. Uh, of course, it's not going to end there at at the end of the year. <clears throat> and what we do then, those notes below, uh, the school district financially compared year to year, uh, we're really pretty consistent on how much uh, we spend in, in relation. So we don't really um, change a lot because <clears throat> our operations are really pretty consistent year to year. And to see more on that, again, January 19th. Okay, continuing on. So what we have next here is, is a breakdown by, by function. So that's instruction, activities, uh, what we have listed here on the left-hand column. Uh, this is primarily what the, what the school district does and spent within our, our general fund. And again, putting together, getting prepared for January 19th budget workshop. Uh, we're pretty consistent on, on, on how we spend our money <laughs> in, in relations to, for example, our, our ratio between instruction to support really tracks straight across and really looking at the numbers here, uh, we're consistent again with that pattern. One thing that we would do in our business office of putting this together, if we did find an anomaly, um, or most likely that would be part of our detection policy of, of going through is perhaps um, perhaps payroll got double posted. That would definitely skew one of these numbers. So um, part of what we do here at the business office, not only do we put together these numbers, but we also monitor. We, we have self, con we, self con we, we do have self control, <laughs> but we also have uh, financial controls put in place that, uh, that the money is being spent on the purposes and, and what it's actually <laughs> meant for. That is, uh, purchase orders that are being paid, those really do belong to the school district. Uh, they don't belong to our transportation department's uh, personnel. We're not paying our own bills, just the school district bills. Again, to learn more about this, budget workshop, January 19th. I wanted to also include here, um, going forward, we also have some graphs in here. This is the same information of what we've we just shown before, but in blue and in red, graph form. And on January 19th, if I haven't mentioned it before, we'll have a, a workshop with plenty of graphs and also pie charts. Ooh. And <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> Thank you. And then, of course, you know that uh, enrollment is important, and a large part of our, our funding and the funding formula is based on attendance. And so that's something that, that we track, and we also are required to report to the state is in our enrollment and our attendance numbers. And so we are <clears throat> tracking through there. So that's December's, December numbers. Uh, now what we have next here is our construction project. And again, what I want to point out here, and, and, and I love bringing this up, that this comes right out of our system. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of activity, because uh, we actually haven't started breaking ground yet or opening up bids. But uh, again, I just want to point out that we have one ledger, one source that we all go to. 
there's not separate uh, accounting, there's not separate spreadsheets and, and separate um, back of the napkin um, figuring out that goes on. It all happens in one sheet and through our system. Yeah. I just have one quick question. Sure. Um, on Lake City, and I have Brian's back there and he can answer it easily. Um, the bond maintenance outside the general construction, that one was a little bit over. Was it some, I was just curious, a little bit more information about that. If I'm term interpreting this right. Sure. So you're looking at the, the, the 49 compared to yeah. the 58. Trying to pull it up right here um, where I have some detail. I believe we pulled out a small piece of that project from the general contract bid in order to address it. And I, um, I'm thinking it was the track. Yeah. So that it looks like it went over by a little bit. So money would be transferred from contingency or hold back to cover that overage um, at some point when we start re. We're looking, we, we um, try and treat the budgets for the bond as sort of a living budget when costs come in, we'll make adjustments. And the goal is to have the budget completely, um, you know, up to date when, on bid day when we're looking at what sorts of bids we could accept. Okay, perfect, thank you. <laughs> and then far as construction goes, we do have a bid with Lake City High School coming up and I just want to double check my calendar before I say it because I've been saying I've been saying the 19th so much it's the, it's the 17th mm -hmm. and that's the bond opening and I'm sorry that's actually the bid opening sorry and that's at the district office and I believe it's at in the evening at five o'clock So I kind of rolled my finance report and construction update uh, financial report kind of to one little roll out there. <clears throat> okay. Any questions for Chris? Okay. We'll save our questions for the 19th, it sounds like. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So item D is a superintendent search update, and I'll just give this uh, briefly. Bruce Twitchell touched on it earlier, but last week our, uh, our job posting closed for our superintendent position for next school year. We had 34 applicants, uh, which we are very pleased with. Uh, over the next few weeks, um, those folks are being um, researched and vetted and reference checked and all those sorts of things. The board will be meeting on the 22nd to select our uh, final finalists that we'll be bringing into town. And the finalists will come on the week of the 29th. And they face a, a pretty strong schedule that day, um, or the, over those days. So they're here uh, for that week. Uh, be one candidate per day, uh, basically a day or a day and a half that they're here. And throughout those that day that they're with our community, they are meeting with uh, certified staff, classified staff. Uh, there's an event at the Coeur d'Alene Chamber with community and business leaders. They have lunch with students. Uh, they get a tour of town. They meet with principal staff. They meet with district office staff. Uh, and that ends in the evening. They have a one hour uh, session at the Coeur Public Library at 5 o'clock and that'll be on the 29th, the 30th and 31st, possibly the first if we have a fourth candidate, um, at the Coeur Public Library and they'll be there to answer questions. Uh, all those different sessions will we'll have a moderator but they'll answer questions and uh, we'll get feedback from all those stakeholder groups and then um, after their day of interaction with the community is done the next morning they have their formal interviews with the board so it's a jam-packed 30 hours for those folks and getting back to something bruce mentioned earlier will the cea what to at what uh, to what extent will the cea be involved in this 
That's a good. <laughs> it's a good question. So I mean, the way it was set up is um, is um, the board kind of determined how many people would sit on these different panels or these different groups, um, and then we basically sought volunteers and. Uh, Ms. Town's been in charge of that, so maybe we need to just look at that and make sure we have adequate CEA representation in there. Um, but we can follow up with you, at, with you on that over the next uh, couple days and just see where we're at there. Um, basically, the way we did it, I think, on, on uh, our certificate folks is we have one representative per building. Does that sound about right? Um, I, I believe is what we end up doing. We did. And we that asked. was on a... We asked each school to identify one certified staff member, one classified staff member. I still have not heard back from every school. Um, so whether that certified staff member was a, a CEA officer was kind of up to the school to uh, determine who that volunteer would be. Um, but I don't see a problem with adding um, folks to that, those lists. I'll reach out to uh, Bruce and um, company and we'll see what we can make happen. Still time. Okay, and that's all I have on that. Okay, Dr. Olson, item E is our property search. Well, this, these uh, Comments are somewhat anticlimactic um, for those that were anticipating a decision this evening. Uh, obviously, we're continuing our work on um, property reviews leading toward acquisition. Um, one of the uh, focal points of our work is the desire uh, to bring to the February agenda for the Board of Trustees an action on a property selection, if that's at all possible. Um, we have been um, counseled by the folks that are involved with construction uh, and development of the plan that February is uh, probably on the later end of a schedule that would allow us to go through the process, um, finalize a plan, and have a building in place <laughs> for the opening of the 2019-20 school year. Uh, that was uh, really a deadline that I think has been discussed widely in the community and among the staff, and it's certainly everyone's desire to try to meet that. But we're also trying to do that, making the best decision possible on land selection. So as a quick update, I, I want to report that <clears throat> we basically have three properties um, in play, so to speak. Um, number one is uh, a um, six-acre site at Ramsey and Prairie uh, that the board has submitted an offer on um, actually today, our return uh, from uh, the weekend, uh, and uh, that has been transmitted to the owner, and uh, we're uh, waiting to find the results uh, to the owner's reaction. A second property uh, has been brought to us uh, actually by a combination of people, but through the support and assistance of, of uh, Mr. John Butler. Uh, it's a realtor in the community who's done um, long work and, and good service in this community, uh, not only in the private sector, but supporting the public sector in, in their efforts. Uh, we'll call this uh, parcel or, or this combination of parcels uh, the North Atlas site. How does that sound? Um, and it's uh, obviously uh, in the Atlas School area. Um, right now we're adjudicating the property. Uh, some parcels of the property have buildings on them that we have been, uh, at, at least at this particular stage, uh, led to uh, believe that uh, our possible purchases of the district and clearance of those properties uh, or, or clearance of those buildings uh, on the properties to create um, uh, a um, up to a 10 or 11 acre site uh, for a, our school district and for the new elementary school. And the third site is the uh, current Hayden Lake Nexa site uh, that uh, again is being discussed. We have some meetings uh, this week and over the next couple of weeks with the city of Hayden 
uh, to kind of clarify where they stand on um, the advisability of that site and uh, the prospect for us perhaps to expand the site uh, beyond the portion of the property that we own. Uh, so those are in play. There was a fourth site, you may recall, and that was a Wyoming and Government Way. Uh, and in interactions uh, with our board, and interestingly, uh, with uh, members of the community, members of the staff, uh, it was uh, generally agreed, and by the way, we had a purchase option on that site, and um, we basically have come to the conclusion that that uh, is probably the least advisable of, of the four choices, and we have let that um, um, uh, option expire at this particular stage. Uh, certainly, and there's a chance to look at it again in the future, but it's one at this particular stage that comes in a distant fourth of the four choices uh, um, that are uh, on record, uh, and we've whittled them down to three. So a great deal of work um, yet to do, and again, our hope is that uh, at our next board meeting, we can bring a recommendation to the Board of Trustees based on the work that um, all of us have done. And, and I, I want to make an editorial comment here, and that is we've done this in somewhat of a, an uncharacteristic way, and that is um, based on the fact that uh, we lost a superintendent last spring and uh, a, a bus chief business official last spring, uh, we had an interim and a rookie uh, coming into the role here. Uh, and our board chair and members of our board of trustees uh, stepped up and said, we cannot let this wait. That We have to stay on task, keep working on this, uh, keep compiling opportunities and evaluating uh, property purchase options. We all recognize uh, that uh, uh, Chairman Morse Rowe and, and other board trustees were somewhat out of their proverbial lane uh, as board members in doing this. But thank goodness they were, because the work that's been done by our trustees uh, and uh, now with the, the new staff members uh, uh, catching up on this has kept us in play and ha has kept this process in play and kept us moving forward. Um, I want to thank uh, all of our board trustees, but particularly uh, Chairman Morris Rowe for staying with this uh, I'm very sorry to hear that you've lost your full-time job. Um, <laughs> in deference to this one, yes. Uh, but it's been worthwhile and necessary for us to get to this point. And um, I also want to thank all of the members of the audience who spoke to this issue tonight and, of course, all the other um, uh, people in the community that have strong feelings about this. Uh, there is... Uh, as was said earlier, there is no perfect answer to this. Uh, there are options within options and opportunities within opportunities, and we've got to bring our collective work together, evaluate the pros and cons and the opportunities before us, and um, make a recommendation. And we're hoping that we can do that in February, and um, all I can say is stay tuned as we continue our work. Members, any questions, comments on that? Well, we should note uh, the status of some of these offers that are on the table pretty soon, I assume. Could we possibly make the decision before the end of, before the February meeting, we have a special meeting and make a decision if we need to? I guess I'm just, maybe we don't need to do that, but I just, I do, I do think we need to make a decision. Uh, and I've been feeling, I've been feeling pressure. I know that other board members have been uh, feeling the same thing that we come up with a decision. It seems like it's ever changing. This is the interesting new information this evening from uh, from Hayden City Council and other people that have spoke. So I don't know. I, I, I we have a couple couple offers on the table, don't we? Have at least we do. Okay, uh, we do. And uh, I, I would think if it was the board's pleasure to act on this before February, that they would appropriately notice the community and. Um, and, and uh, move in that direction where um, folks who have long labored on this and um, long upheld um, uh, the process uh, would certainly be present uh, for the final decision. 
but uh, I, I think a more reasonable touch point would be our February board meeting if everything falls into place. And, and uh, again, I, uh, Trustee May is uh, another person who's given a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy uh, to this particular process, trying to keep options and opportunities in front of the board. So it's, it's been uh, uh, a very interesting process. Certainly, in retrospect, um, uh, all of us would have wanted to do it a different way. All of us would have wanted, wanted to have land in the bank already. Um, and uh, for a number of different reasons, those options weren't possible. So, um, and I think of long range planning and, and our, our colleagues, uh, again, in the audience and in the community, <laughs> along with board members. Um, we've, we've kept this thing going and it's been a, a very interesting time with lots of passion uh, being tied to it and appropriately so. Uh, it's an important decision. Uh, and uh, I'm profoundly confident that this board will make a great decision and that um, if indeed we meet the timelines that are before us, that we're gonna open a terrific elementary school in the 2019-20 school year, just like we have before throughout this district. So. Um, and if they do, if we do that, Will you be there to cut the ribbon? I'll be there to show th to to uh, throw a shovel full of dirt if you invite me, <laughs> right. uh, and I'll be wearing my hockey jersey, not a suit. <laughs> um, I'm 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 very excited about um, uh, again when I talk with with Steve and board members uh, and members of this community about the energy um, that is behind all of this work and the focus on the present and the future in this community. Lord knows that um, uh, no matter how hard we try, we can't hope for a better past. Uh, what has happened in the past has, has happened. Uh, we can learn from not only our successes, but as importantly, uh, from our mistakes. And it's a collective ours because you weren't a seated board when a lot of this went on. Um, but uh, I think they were people who, just like you, were hardworking, well-intended, well-focused, and dealing with the issues of the, of the day and the resources that they had available to them. Uh, but we've got to push ahead, and uh, I'm, I'm really confident uh, that we're going to get there and we're going to make a great decision. So, again, thank you. Okay, well thank you for your efforts. I know we're trying to tie up some loose ends, so we're making sure when we are making a decision, we, we have all the information that we can to make the best decision we can. So, thank you, Dr. Olson. Okay, item F, which is for info, is our policy discussion on 3265, which is the personal electronic devices. Uh, as you recall, we had a long discussion last month about this, and I believe Seth Dennison, our director of technology and crew, um, took the feedback that we gave last month and have uh, revised, made revisions to the policy. And that was included in our packet today. So do, did I sum that up pretty good, Seth? Yep. So, so let's start out with, do we have any questions on this policy or on the language on this policy? Let's, let's start there. <clears throat> I have a couple. Uh, looking at this policy, would students be allowed to use their cell phones in passing periods? Yeah, that would depend on the procedures uh, that we set. Um, so as you might recall, the first step was kind of to set the policy, and then the second step was to set the procedures. So. Uh, depending on on what you decide on tonight, then we'll move move forward from there. So the once we have policy set, you plan to draft the procedures. You'll bring that back to us. Mm -hmm. um, and just if, just if, a if, question on that sure. on that process. Remember, tonight is for information only. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still chewing on this. We have a thirty day um, review period, and so February would be. Um, given the preference of the board, would be uh, uh, the time would, that we would act on approval of the policy. 
Uh, my question to you is, would you want us to work simultaneously on the 30-day uh, feedback period and the honing of procedures based on the draft that's before us or that you uh, uh, pass on tonight? Sure. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, we need to get this done, but I can still ask questions about this, right? Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you can see in the second paragraph there, um, there is a, a line that sort of alludes to the procedures that are, are potentially coming. Uh, students may possess and utilize personal electronic devices outside the classroom only for school appropriate activities as authorized by school administration. So that would be you know the building principal along with their staff able to set you know like that grid that that we showed i think last month's board meeting um hallways lunch lunchroom uh, that sort of stuff another question with this policy that you've laid out here kids students can have personal communication devices turned off on their bodies and their possession in a classroom correct how does that jive with kids who are slipping those things out of their pockets and cheating on tests? That's, our, that's actually already addressed in, on our current policy and procedures as well. That would be cheating. And so there's consequences for that, just like there are for any other uh, cheating. The, the current policy um, uh, set up a situation where uh, a specific teacher could allow kids to bring cell phones to class for specific lessons. Mm -hmm. It hasn't turned out well. I mean, we've got teachers pitted against teachers by kids, and you end up with PE teachers telling kids, oh, yeah, bring your cell phones to class, you know, because all the other teachers are allowing it as well. And it's just spiraled out of control. I have a problem with this. So is, is there any way we could make it so that kids cannot bring cell phones to class, period? Well, we, you know, we could decide that. I mean, you, you're, I'm answering the question you're asking, Seth. My, my, my whole thing, I've read, it, read this over and I read over your, your write up, rewriting up there and I think it's a good, you did a good job. The only change I would say that I uh, that I kind of suggested last time was that uh, device. It says uh, in the first paragraph, devices should be powered off and out of sight in a classroom. I would I had I wrote in there out of sight and not in the physical possession of. That was the same issue we kind of debate we got into before, and some of the other trustees didn't agree with that. But I still believe that they shouldn't be on their in their physical possession. They should be um, in a backpack, maybe somewhere. They should be maybe in a a bin at the in front of the classroom the teacher keeps an eye on whatever I don't think that should be in their physical possession because I've heard of these same situations where kids have the phone on them it's in their pocket it vibrates or it's whatever uh, it's just much harder to monitor if it's sitting on their in their possession I think it shouldn't be in their possession that's my opinion and I would agree that monitoring is the the challenge there and that's part of why uh, the language out of sight was included because that's much easier to enforce than not on your person. Um, for instance, if there's, it, it looks like a student could have a cell phone in a pocket, but you're not sure that sort of creates uh, some amb ambiguity there for staff members. So I think out of sight is potentially easier to enforce as is powered off. Um, you know, in, in the example that you gave trustee Eubanks, seeing a cell phone on underneath a desk, for example, that obviously does not uh, meet this policy, and so that makes it relatively easy to enforce. Uh, but what if you don't see it? That, I mean, that's gonna be the problem regardless, right? Yeah. Even if you ban it in the classroom and you don't see it, then it's hard to enforce. I'm, con I'm concerned about these kids who get straight A's in some of these difficult classes, and they have their cell phones in their possession. And then they take a standardized test and they bomb. I have a problem that you're kind of, I don't know if you're accusing these kids of cheating, but there are a lot of kids that work very hard in their <laughs> classrooms that are getting A's. How can, you, how can you say that they're getting A's because of their cell phone? I'm just suggesting. I have a daughter in my own oh. house who busts her butt studying 
And it's not because of her cell phone that she's getting A's. And I get that, and I'm not accusing anybody. I'm simply reporting what has been told to me by high school kids now in both of our main high schools. They laugh about it. And not every, not every student is cheating, but we shouldn't make it easy for those who want to cheat. And I think as long as we have this addictive device in their pockets, as long as we have this attention-grabbing 24-7 kind of, a, of a, an electronic narcotic at their disposal, I think we're just tempting too many kids. I'm not talking about the majority. I'm talking about some kids. And I, and I come to this as a 43-year veteran classroom teacher, and I've been there. You know, if kids have an opportunity to cheat, some of them will. And sadly, they'll find another way to cheat, the kids that you were talking about. It's just fact. So we can't punish everyone else and just say that this is going on. And I'm sorry if a teacher is giving a test in a classroom and a kid can take his cell phone out and look stuff up and not get caught, that is a problem. That's a problem with the teacher giving the test in the classroom. They're, they're not pulling them out like you just demonstrated. They're sitting there with a table over them and they're doing it under the table and they're able to negotiate this thing and get information and just lean back and look. It's hard to detect this. If the, if the cell phone is not in the classroom, not in their possession, the problem is solved. I just have a question about the policy, just some wording on it. Okay. And I, 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 think to, I think we're all on the same page that we want to create a policy that um, limits or eliminates the use of cell phones in the classroom. But we must create a policy that is enforceable and that has longevity. We have yo-yoed between policies now in the last decade. It would be my hope that we create a policy that we are not adapting in two, three, four, five years. Thank you for this policy. I think it's a great start. The only question that I have, or not a great start, I think it's great, is I'm confused by the wordage of um, students may possess and utilize PEDs outside of the classroom only for school appropriate activities. And I felt as though you're using language that would be difficult to quantify and enforce. So if we're going to allow students to check work schedules, parents request to pick up children, that's not a school related activity. So I, I was confused by what you were going with that. Yeah, and that was probably something I would define in the procedures okay. is what's appropriate for school use. Uh, you know, we could get into the social media aspect of, of things if we're wanting it to be solely just communication for. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that we can tell a 17 or 18 year old um, when they're at lunch on their free time, you know, how they can use a digital device. I hear what you're saying that. These are addictive devices, they're abused, students are maltreated, but we also have to teach them digital citizenry and by really mandating what adults, these are young adults, head off to college and into the workforce, creating policy that's gonna be virtually impossible. Is a principal gonna go around to each student at lunch and make sure that they're doing school appropriate cell phone use? So let's write a policy that is enforceable and is tight and in the best interests of the student and the staff and the principal and the district. And then let's use education to say what is appropriate cell phone use. Let's have let's get some sort of you know digital citizenship education going, but a policy I don't think that's so restrictive on what they're doing lunchtime between classes, if they have block scheduling and they've got 20 minutes here and there, maybe they're applying for college. I don't know what they're doing, but can we adjust that terminology if we all come to agreement? Yeah, I have, a, I have a, a meeting place for you on this. I'm fine with kids having their cell phones available to them during lunch. That would be like employees in the workplace nationwide. I mean, uh, most places where you work as an adult in the adult world, you can use your cell phone whenever you want during lunchtime. But during work time, I wonder how many young people under the age of 30 in our country have lost a job in recent years because of their misuse of a cell phone. I have a grandson who's already lost three. So between so, lunchtime would be fine. 
but passing between classes wouldn't be fine. I mean, I think we have to be careful. I, I hear what you're saying. The next question I had, and I think this is what Dave's frustration, and I feel the same frustration as that. I had a parent today saying, oh, my student's doing his driver's ed during class. Well, wait a second. Why are we allowing students to get on their device and take their driver's ed online course during class? So it's going to require implementation, and maybe that's what we're getting with the procedure piece of this. But does that need to be written into the policy somewhere? That I think what Dave is saying is, if we write a policy, it has to be enforced. And I mean, that's the part, the procedure part. Maybe that's what Dr. Olson was getting at. That we submit all of those next month, so we can look at them to make sure we have a plan to implement this policy. Yeah, I mean, to me, it comes back to education and enforcement again. I mean, this is uh, something that I shared last month when, when we spoke about this. But um, I, I think the next step for us and our administrators is really to establish those procedures that are enforceable um, and, and then for our school staff to really hold hands on whatever the procedures are that we come up with and enforce them well. And I'm just curious, how would you guys go about enforcing a policy if we're restricting cell phone use during class time? What do you is mean? So, exactly? Is there someone walking around classroom to classroom ensuring the students aren't, you know, it required the teacher to make sure their lessons are the appropriate amount of length, the students have adequate work to do. I mean, it's going to be a mindset change of epic proportion. And so I just wonder what it looks like when we enforce this policy next, or we pass this policy next month. It will be a change in what's happening now, and are we ready for it? And and I just want to make sure we're prepared so we're not launching into something that what Dave is saying, we're pitting teachers against one another. I'd hate to see it crash and burn. Maybe uh, Trina can speak to that. I sure. have a couple of thoughts. One, I think the policy also needs to be easier on teachers. Because uh, when I've talked to teachers, they've, and, and a couple of administrators, they said, you know, take this off our back. Let us, you know, don't, you know, make, the, you know, one, one principal even said, if, if the students complain, I'll just blame it on the school board. I said, that sounds great. I'm more, more than willing to, I'm more than willing to say, I'll be the bad guy in this situation. So I think it needs to be easier on the staff. And, and uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't, a lot of these issues can be cleaned up, I think, in procedures. I think you're right on that. Um, I, I am still hung up on this, uh, not in the physical possession of more than just out of sight. I think it needs to be a little stronger. Um, as far as the between classes and lunch time, when I've talked to some principals, they've uh, kind of wanted that discretion. They wanted that discretion within their own building to make up those kind of rules as to how what happens outside the classroom. And maybe the board can be the heavies inside the classroom. We can be the ones that say, this can't happen in the classroom. But outside the classroom, I'm, I'm fine with trusting the uh, principals and whatever, whoever other staff, the, uh, the district administration, whatever, to come up with procedures that uh, the work in a particular school between classes or at lunch hour. But I'm pretty, pretty solid. I haven't, the lot, you know, we've been all working on this thing for a few months here. And I, and you know, the more I think about this, I I'm just really think it's, it's, uh, we're doing the teachers a favor and doing the students a favor by having a pretty solid policy that they're not in their possession. Just this morning, I was, I, I, wa I listened to a news article, a news thing on CBS News about uh, that some stockholders of a Apple uh, had gone to, had requested that that Apple come up with more restrictions, more controls over the mm -hmm. iPhone when dealing with juveniles. I, don't, you, I see you're shaking your head. You probably saw the n same news thing. I thought it was really interesting because they're basically saying, this is an addictive device. We need to give parents uh, more control over the situation. And these stockholders are asking Apple to come up with some better ways to control the use of this. We can't control what Apple does or with their iPhone, but we can control what happens in the classroom. We can say, and I think we should make it as easy on teachers as possible. That's why I say it's off. It's not in their physical possession. Teacher doesn't have to deal with it, you know. Uh, it's just, and I mean, there, there will be some de degree of enforcement, of course, and there is going to be a cultural change here. But, I, but I think that that's, you know, that's what we need to do going forward. That's my opinion. All right, let me try to get some a little resolution here. Just clear up a couple of things, Seth. On the policy, it it's going to define things by grade level, if if I recall from before. So there's going to be a set of rules that elementary, which is 
no device and a, di a separate set of rules for middle school and high school is that for the procedures yeah that was one uh, suggestion that our administrators had was that we better deline delineate between middle school and high school so yes that was our intention I, I think the bulk of our discussion and let's make sure we're correct is uh, we're, we're talking at the high school level and are we somewhat unanimous in envisioning the lower levels as much more restrictive like right now elementary is no no cell phones yes I, bell to bell okay all right Trustee Eubanks and Trustee Hearn have both uh, raised these, the idea of not on the person. And I think we need to give some clear direction on that. So I think we need to pull, you know. I know where you two stand. I know where I stand. Uh, Lisa and Tambra, where are you on not in their physical possession? I uh, would be the opposite of Tom and Dave. As long as it's on them and off, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. So you're okay with the current language of um, yes. powered off and out of sight? Yes. And Lisa? Okay. I am too. And I hate to boil it down to doing it that way, but we got to come up with some consensus or a majority rule, I guess, on it. Um, Casey, I but I mean, I think we still keep working towards. I would personally, before we vote on this, I would very much would like to see the procedures because that's going to make up a huge yeah. chunk of this. And so. for mine, I just want to clarify one thing because I think this is I hear both sides and I, it's kind of confusing. So is this would this policy be, policy be stating if, for instance, we're talking about high school, the student finishes their they've done their lecture, they've done their assignment, and is the teacher then allowed to say, well, you can get on your cell phone? Or are we saying no? They're even if they finish their work. No, it has to. Uh, that's so I just want to make sure I'm clear I'm clear on what this is saying if if yeah if you look towards the bottom there it, it really defines educational purposes so I think it would have to have a, a legitimate specific Quizlet time bound whatever. educational purpose that's what I was hoping um, that third paragraph down uh, really was the, the attempt at defining some of that uh, to try to get away from from some of that just carte blanche use <clears throat> I think the problem, one of the problems we have with our current policy was it left too many loopholes and too much wiggle room. And so many kids have just run right for them. And that's why we have the problem we have, the problems we have today. I would like to see a policy that's tight, that's simple, that's, that's uh, commonly understood by everybody. And uh, with no wiggle room, no loopholes. I mean, having been a classroom teacher for most of my life, the idea, and I mentioned this at our last meeting, of trying to explain to kids the, the intricacies of conjugating irregular verbs in Spanish while somebody's looking at who knows what on their cell phone and not paying any attention is just infuriating. I don't want to have to deal with that at all as a teacher. And I don't think any of our teachers should have to deal with it either. That's why I believe the cell phone should not even be on their person in a classroom. But let's, let's get rid of any loopholes, any wiggle room. And when you start talking about, well, maybe we could let them do it here, maybe we could let them have them there or whatever, it's just going to end up the same way. I think we need to be very clear, very concise, and we need to have consequences for violate, violating the policy laid out very clear for the entire district and expect that it will be uni they will uniformly be applied. I would uh, agree that no teacher should have to deal with that either. Um, just in general, if I'm having a conversation with someone, I wouldn't even want to have to deal with them looking up at their phone. It's just rude and disrespectful. Um, but I, I think the problem lie, you know, was in enforcement, um, not that we didn't have a policy, but that it wasn't being enforced and it wasn't being enforced properly. So we really need to make sure that it is enforced and that our building administrators are enforcing it and um, making sure that teachers aren't pitted against teachers or whatnot, what's been taking place. But um, they're gonna have to step up and just make sure that, it, that it's being enforced, um, making it easier for our teachers. Um, but dig digital citizenship is definitely um, something that 
our kids and adults need to learn. The, I would just argue, maybe agree there a little bit. I, you know, I think a lot of the practices we've heard about um, and, and the things that teachers have been upset with or parents or even students are things that really aren't allowed under our current policy, but they've been allowed. And it's either through a misunderstanding of what the policy says, a complete you know, disregard for it or knowledge of it, or you know, just, just well, blatant ignoring it. Yeah, I'm not sure which it is, and it's probably a combination of all those things. So I, again, I think the part of the policy is just making it more uniform. I think part of just our big discussions here and the attention that we've given this is going to um, at least hammer that to administrators who are then going to hammer it to staff. And I think with the, I think this is easier and it, it, from compared to what we currently have. At a meeting we had a month or so ago, Teresa Kaiser, who's the principal at Project, talked about her school, and she basically said, I need to get a handle on this. She had half of her teachers letting kids have phones whenever they wanted and half of them not. And it was an issue. And it was putting teacher versus teacher. It was putting, you know, kids were picking classes sometimes based on that or who they wanted for a teacher. And she just said, no, we, there are no phones in our school anymore. And for the first three weeks, you know, and I think she does it at lunch is how she would like to have it at her school. But for the first couple of weeks, it was bad. And in those first couple of weeks, she had one or two teachers that were still allowing it. And she had to go to them and say, look, we signed on this. You know, we signed on to this together. And we have to be together on this or it's going to completely crumble. I need you to enforce the policy. And that's going to be much harder to do at Coeur High School and Lake City High School because they're four or five, you know, they're ten times the size. But that's what's going to have to happen regardless of what the policy is. And we could say no cell phones and they're still going to have cell phones. Kids who want to cheat are still going to cheat. They're going to go in the bathroom to do these things. They're just going to go to the bathroom more if they want to communicate and cheat with their buddy. It, you know, I mean, 43 years ago, kids were cheating and yeah. there weren't cell phones. I spoke to a, teach, a teacher at Venture, and he's a science teacher, and he said it has transformed their school, and they, but they all uniformly enforce it, right. and that's been the key to success for them. And, and absolutely, if this is going to work, just like any policy we could have, or any rule or law in our state, you know, or, or in our society, if it's going to work, people have to follow it, and people have to enforce it, and if they're not going to enforce it, then it's not going to work. It's like speeding. Everyone knows you can go five miles an hour over and not get a ticket. Well, guess what? Everyone drives five miles an hour over the speed limit. And kids are going to be the same way. If they all know I can pull it out when I finish my work, they're all going to pull it out when they finish their work. And so we, we, you know, we have to say no, and then we have to expect that that's going to happen as it trickles down. If it doesn't, then we do this again. I have another question. Okay. And this is about liability, the district's liability, the school's liability for these devices. Some of these devices are now costing more than $1,000. If one of them gets stolen, if one of them gets damaged, if somebody throws it in a basket and someone else drops a 20-pound weight on it and it's destroyed, are we liable for this? Is the teacher liable? That's is actually that made very clear? That's specifically addressed in our procedures, okay. uh, again, that that by bringing a device on to our campus, they're assuming liability. Like, just like if you had your cell phone in a grocery store and you dropped it, the grocery store is not going to be liable for that. You would be. What if the teacher broke it? <laughs> oh, never mind. That was a joke. So, so just to be clear, the, so just to be clear in my mind, the board's <coughs> division is only. We seem to be pretty united in not wanting the cell phones on in the classroom we're with with only rare circumstances where the teacher authorizes it for specific reasons and then in most cases students would be using um, laptop computers or wherever else we have in the classroom uh, the same the main division seems to be over whether or not they should be in our, their physical possession mr eubanks and i think they shouldn't be uh, other trustees think they should be so i'm just trying to be clear uh if if that that will make me to um, help me make a decision on how I vote when this thing comes up, because I, I may not support the policy if those wording is not in there. But I'll think on that for the next month. One other thing I'd like to bring up, and I'll then I'll shut up about it. But uh, letting kids access their cell phones during passing period, 
passing period is about five minutes long in most of our schools. And uh, it's designed to allow kids time enough to get from one class to another class, maybe stop by their locker, pick up uh, needed uh, school supplies, homework, whatever for the next class, and maybe visit the restroom quickly. If there's enough time in that for them to also pick up their cell phone and do whatever they're gonna do on their cell phone, I would suggest they have too much time during passing period. And I think that in itself would be a distraction. I think it would promote tardiness. And why on earth would somebody, some student, need to know between two classes whether someone else is throwing a party Saturday night and they're not invited? Why on earth would they need to know that mom has a sandwich for you that she's gonna drop off in the main office? When the main office gets it, they're gonna give it to you anyway. I, I have a concern about cell phone usage between classes. I would like to see cell phones not on students' possession, in students' possession, from the opening bell until lunchtime, and then after lunchtime until the end of the school day. I would, I would vote for that in a heartbeat. And I will probably be alone, and that's fine. But I've been in a classroom situation and in a school situation for decades, and I just see all kinds of problems coming out of this. Clear enough? Uh, yeah, I think so. So uh, since it's coming to you tonight for information, it'll go out for 30-day public review. We'll bring it back next month uh, with any comments received uh, for action. Okay. And we'll have procedures? So yeah, we'll have a draft uh, procedures as well. Zeth, are we going to leave, though, the, the, that piece about um, the approved? That was still a little confusing. Is it going to go out like that? Um, school, school appropriate yeah. activities. School appropriate activities. Is there a different terminology you could put in there that might be a little bit less ambiguous? Or sure, or we can strike it. I mean, it's a, it's a, up to all of you. I think that makes it grayer, and I think it makes it more difficult to enforce if we're going to allow them to use them, let's say, at lunch, and we have a list now of school appropriate activities. I think that's exceedingly it's, difficult. So, what if it said students may possess and utilize PEDs outside of the classroom? as authorized by school administration and according to the grade level procedures. And then we could add a sentence about if they're being used inappropriately and you know they have their code of conduct, then they will sure. face the consequence. You know, whenever we could add that in there to reinforce yeah. it. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. If there's nothing further, let's move on to item G, which is additional policy for information we have four in here today. And is there anyone particular that's handling these? This town? Or? They're all putting their heads down, turning away. It's, it looks very familiar to me. <laughs> I don't think so. They're all pointing, pointing fingers. No, we're not. <laughs> he did that trick to me, too. All right, thank you. So I will be talking, and Amy will, I'm sure, jump in at any point, uh, about policy 2375 and 2377. Uh, 2375 was just a simple change. As you probably remember, that particular policy is based on ADA law uh, related to service animals in schools. The only thing we added to that policy was a cross-reference to our new policy 2377. Uh, making sure that it's very clear that these are two separate policies, one related to service animals and one related to other animals in schools. Uh, the way the former policy, um, 2377 was like eight something, the way it previously read was it, everything was intermingled. There were uh, references to service animals within that policy. It was really messy. And um, when we had a little question come up at a school, um, and we had somebody looking at that policy versus the service animal policy, I could see why that would be messy. So we decided to pull that out, clean it up, run it through the attorneys to make sure that we were keeping the two distinct and clear, and then are bringing that forward for your review. Is it still possible for kids to bring a miniature horse to school as a service animal? It is, according to ADA law. Mm -hmm. When that happens, would you let us know? I will. I, we have not seen that yet, but I will. It's going to be adorable. With a cell phone. 
<laughs> <laughs> I'll text you a picture at lunch. Is that really, lunch, that's yes. in the law, miniature horses is in yes. the law? Mm -hmm. That's amazing to me that yeah. they would be that specific about miniature horses. Yes, it's the why, only. Why do you just name miniature horses and not, you know, pigs or some other kind of animal? I mean, I don't the understand. The only other it. animal reference besides dogs. Mm -hmm. Is dogs. Well, I understand the dogs, particularly for uh, people who have sight issues and things like that. Uh, you know, I, I understand dogs. I just, the miniature horses seems, I don't know. That seems, yeah, it, it, we never I, had a case, I understand, uh, Lynn, I asked you about that. I've never had a situation in this district, have we? Uh, it, min, about miniature horse. So I, I did look that up. Um, a, a public entity or private business must allow a person with a disability to bring a miniature horse on the premises as long as it has been individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of an individual with a disability. And then it goes on. And to that's the only the animal little. besides a the dog they've authorized. Right, correct. No snakes or birds or anything. Well, else. I did see something about a, <laughs> a service, service turkey, but I think that was service not allowed turkey. on the <laughs> airplane, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I, all right. Well, if it's under the law, that's fine. It just seems silly <laughs> to me, but, you know. It, it has to be housebroken, so that's good at yeah. least. Well, that's nice. I, I'm <laughs> glad that horse going down the, the hallways is housebroken. <laughs> God. Okay, how about 2435, which is advanced opportunities? Absolutely, Chair Morris, Superintendent Olson, and members of the board. 2435P references the procedures for the suite of advanced opportunities as provided by the state of Idaho. Uh, you may remember from the data summit, we have seen an explosion in the amount of students using these funds to take advanced coursework, overload courses, dual credit exams, uh, certification courses such as that. With that has also come a variety of what ifs uh, and who is qualifying in which areas and some gray areas. Uh, the 2435 attempts to simply make sure that we are consistent throughout all of our district schools, that students are really taking the responsibility for uh, 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 soliciting for the funds, uh, who is responsible for maintaining the quality of the use of those funds, and then the communication, of course, back to the parent or guardian. Questions on this one? Uh, Dr. Nelson, I had one just at the beginning. It says, students should make sure that they and their parents or guardians have carefully read the program's provisions. Correct. And uh, it, it seemed to me that there's a bit of a disconnect in that it's school to student and then student to parent is how I see the communication chain going on this and knowing that sixth seventh and eighth graders uh, can be involved in this not necessarily that they would do all this without parents uh, consideration but I just wondered if um, you know, I think you and I talked about this before you know people who are in eighth graders in ALP algebra right now some don't realize that's a high school course and that's going to be on their transcript unless they specifically request that it not be absolutely and and Chair Morris, one of the pieces that's helpful in this is the very first bullet, the very first number one that you see there is that the student as well as the parents and guardians sign the participation form. Uh, the participation form does address those credits that will automatically be transferred to the high school. It will also address how those funds are to be used. Um, so we do try to maintain with that and that participation form is reviewed every year as students matriculate through the system. Thank you. And then on the second page of it, uh, which would be page 95 in our packet, mm -hmm. um, just that first sentence, uh, which I know is carrying over from the page before, but mm -hmm. is that supposed to mean something to me and just doesn't, where it says, with non-credit bearing classes, periods D as a full load. And I'm not looking the within the packet. I'm looking on my actual document. So it looks like it's paginated a little bit differently. Hmm. Yeah, That's so why I thought it was, but it. I thought, well, is that just something I don't understand? or is that a, I uh, will find it within 85. and make sure that it's clear. I think it's just got a, a letter D by itself in there for no reason. Um, it's the first sentence. Yep, I'm pulling it up here. Yep, it is a typo within the procedure. We'll get that fixed. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that one? Okay, and then 8140P. Uh, <clears throat> that one is mine. Okay. 
<laughs> this one's actually really quite simple. Uh, it is if a student. This addresses if a student had an IEP um, that that then would point them towards uh, policy eight one four zero, which does go over IEPs. It's, this is on school bus safety, the 840P, right? So my only thought when I look, read this over was that I, I've met with Jill Hill and I think a few others, of, I'm not sure if you were at that meeting or not, but we're discussing changing some of the uh, procedures in buses in relation to those buses having seatbelts. So, you know, we can adopt this, but I would imagine we'll be back changing it again in a few months once we get those wording figured out. Is that, or, or maybe our, maybe that's- This is on a, discipline, Tom. This is just on the discipline This is part. discipline. Yes, yeah. this is tra uh, <clears throat> transportation-related discipline. Uh, so the ISBA that's what came was back and they- you just look at the red <clears throat> line on page 98, that very top sentence. I'm- guessing before it probably could be interpreted that students on IEPs could be disciplined under the, the bus transportation discipline policy which wouldn't take into account their account their IEP and that's why we're changing this or right they they have you probably know even better Amy than I do but there's different you can't discipline the student with an IEP the same way you could a general population student because you you know because like I said if something that they possibly couldn't do or, or there's a city, it, can, it depends on how it's written out. So there's some special latitude for that student. Well, the, so the school bus, like the class room, all students have a similar discipline policy, but for students with disabilities, uh, like in the classroom, they may have a, a rights afforded to them uh, that the students plans, accommodations, um, on the bus and their behavior intervention plans will be supported also on the bus. But I'm, I'm a little confused with how this is written. No, so what... No, so it goes back to, so it, this one didn't reference the IEP, so it, it references back to policy 8140, and policy 8140 does. This um, is policy 8140. This is just the procedures part. But. If there's too much confusion here, we can we can revisit this, Tom. If that well, does policy no, I, I, maybe the actual <laughs> policy more specifically defines how a student on an IEP is disciplined on a bus? Right, I think she's pulling it up. Someone pulling up eighty one forty on a mic, please, yeah. for the audience. I had a question about the severe infractions. Should we wait till we sort it out or? So it's just talking about in 8140, it's talking about um, all procedures under IDEA, DEA must be followed with regard to the student and transportation. And then it's referencing a suspension from bus transportation depends on whether bus transportation is identified on the IEP. And then it goes on to describe um, suspension from the bus would be tr treated the same as suspension from school. If, uh, if uh, bus transportation is not on the IEP, a suspension from the bus would not be counted as a suspension from school. Hmm. That's, that's all it's got on 8140 about. Do you want to look at this? I, I think that we would need to take a look at it because then you also have issues of students who are suspected of having a disability that would fall um, under that that they may need to take a look at. Well, this, this would be for 30-day comment period, right? So we could not solve that tonight and look at that over the next that. 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I would recommend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't we do that? Oh wait, uh, Lisa oh. had a question. I had a quick here. question. I'm not sure who's the answer. Se severe infraction includes but not limited to. I was just curious why drugs or alcohol isn't considered a f severe infraction. Is it, I was curious if, it, if we should add it or? I, 
fighting, physical harm, but destruction of property. Mm -hmm. um, the reason it's not included here is because it's covered under our drugs and our alcohol and our drug-free school. So we don't need to have it on here. Correct. So if a student, for example, had alcohol on the alcohol on the bus, mm -hmm. um, transportation wouldn't discipline the student. The school would, and so they would be facing suspension or expulsion depending upon the severity. But doesn't this severe infraction include whether they're allowed to ride the bus anymore? So do we need to, need to put on there to cover it, or would it automatically they lose their bus privileges through their school suspension? Or? They would automatically lose their bus privileges as well as face consequences at the school. Just the other thing that's kind of strange about it as we're looking at it is the exact same sentence was put on two different pages. Yeah, the IEP sentences. That's because it's really important. <laughs> <It must be. laughs> Apparently. Okay, we're getting delirious now. Okay. And if nothing further, we'll see that next month. Okay, we're into action items, folks, and it's 7.30. We're 30 minutes behind schedule. Let's... Uh, see what we have here. Uh, item H is social studies graduation requirements. Dr. Nelson. Yes, sir. Chair Morris, Rose, Superintendent Olson, and members of the board, we had presented to you last month a challenge. And the challenge is that we currently do not meet state graduation requirements with placing world histories in the humanities graduation bucket. It was a decision made several years ago when graduation requirements were changing. Uh, what our request to you is that has received 30 days public review is to move our world history local graduation requirement, not a statewide graduation requirement, that is a quarter lane specific requirement, move it out of humanities, still require the same number of two credits, but simply count it as a social studies credit. Uh, in addition, what that would do is actually provide a little bit more flexibility for our students. Uh, we are already talking with our social studies providers at the high schools of possible new course proposals that would diversify that requirement a little bit more, still focusing on world history, but giving a little bit more choice. So again, moving two credits from humanities out, uh, moving <laughs> two credits from humanities into social studies is the request for you this evening. So, let's see, we did have one comment on this one, is that correct? No, that was on drones. Okay. So, the motion would be to approve the social studies graduation requirement change as presented. That work? Does it, do you want this? Uh, there is a specific motion in here, so let me read that instead. So, motion would be to change the world history requirement from an arts and humanities requirement to a social studies requirement as presented. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Now we are on for policy for action, and we had two last month um, the drones and the fundraising. Any questions on this? I thought the drone comment was good. I mean, it would be hard to be able, I mean, I can see where, and I was curious, who, who made the comment? Do we not normally give the names, or? It, would it, it could have been. It was a, it seemed like it was a teacher, perhaps, because he knew I don't think anybody was talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> knew, knew the policy. Okay. So the motion before us would be to approve policies and procedures as presented. Well, do we want to take into account the, the comment and look at the policy too? Why don't we get a motion in a second and then we'll go into discussion? If we could, should be the way we're supposed to do it. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I would like now to include the comments, uh, or at least talk about them, so we're not limiting uh, teachers at our high schools or middle schools to use drones in their curriculum. I believe they can get. Seth, can you address the comments? Or Trina, whoever? They're, they're pointing fingers again. 
I, I can take Don't this worry. one. Uh, actually, the, the comment uh, received highlights exactly what our, our plan is, and that's to create a form that goes along with it. Uh, really what uh, we were wanting to do with this policy was uh, allow the use of drones uh, on our campuses um, with some rules uh, in place, um, protecting the school district's liability, of course. So uh, our intent certainly is not to, to ban them, but uh, rather to just put in, in place some steps uh, to follow uh, when using them uh, with students. Thank you, Seth. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any, if there's no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are in to call for committee reports. Um, Fundraising thing? Oh, I'm sorry, We're, you're right, we have one more. Which is, no, we just approved them both. Oh, we did, all right, yep. I'm sorry. We just proved the drone. Sorry, was there so any discussion the on the sorry. fundraising one? No. Okay. The call for committee reports. We heard from Long Range Planning earlier from Steve Casey, so you wanna go with that. How about uh, Tambra, have you guys been meeting on the map? What you guys is how many more meetings do you have? Um. Sure, I'm glad to. Uh, Chair Morris Rowe, Superintendent Olson, and members of the board, we will meet for our third time. I think I'm on, aren't I? Hello. Uh, we will meet for our third time coming up uh, on Thursday, and we are currently so, uh, soliciting feedback from each of the committee members. Those will be put together into a packet which will give us the guidance as to where everybody kind of thinks that we're going. Uh, most of the feedback at this point is consistent, but I'd like to get a further uh, dipstick from the committee. Uh, from that point, uh, if the goal is to make a recommendation to the board, we'd like to have it in the February packet, uh, as that may mean some changes for course selections coming up in this next year. How many times have you guys been able to meet so far? Uh, we are having our third time. So this will be actually, this will be our third time. You're hoping to have a recommendation on your third meeting? Or it seems like a lot of information to cover. We, we still have a little bit of ways to okay. go for it. So it'll take us at least another meeting to probably refine what we're looking for. And will your recommendation be in the form of like individual responses from each committee member or will it be drafted by someone on the committee? How do you foresee that? Okay. The intent, of course, is that it's a unified feel from yeah. the committee. Uh, we would love to be able to have a unified recommendation to you for your consideration. I would say. Okay, and then item K is just a couple important dates coming up as we, I don't think we've heard tonight, but on January 19th we have a budget <laughs> workshop. <laughs> no one brought that up for some reason. And then on January 22nd we have our special meeting with the superintendent search. At the district office, that was moved to the district office, one o'clock. We have so many meetings coming up in the next month. Are we getting extra pay for the next month? Yeah. Yeah. Quadruple sure. for the month. Quadruple, okay, yeah, all right, thanks. We're gonna have to dip into the right. balance to do that. But, uh, if, there, if there's nothing further, uh, meeting is adjourned. At least, at least it's four times. <laughs>